imagining this. Yes, I know this. If you stop squirming, I can get you here in one piece. Don't worry, protagonist. I've got you. Well, no, no, no. Now, now I've got you. Hold on. You're almost here. Hello, my protagonist, and welcome to another Doki Doki Donut on Pride Month of all months. We are this happy Pride, everyone. My name is DB. Welcome to Famaria, and welcome to Doki Doki Donut. I, I I know you haven't seen this avatar in a while. You haven't seen me be able to move like this in a while. Oh my God, Comet! Oh, jeez! Ah! Broken avatar there for a moment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Comet! Oh my gosh, Comet! Jeez! Comet coming in with the gifted subs. Thank you so much, Comet, for those five tier one gifted subs. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, I should turn on certain things. Hold on. Hold on, let me see if I have them turned on of your rewards, channel points. We should turn those on because we're on this avatar now. Uh, let's see here. Because it's Pride, we can have Pride Parade. Uh, let's see here. We're, we'll turn on. Well, we're not going to turn on Yoink because we haven't had that set up. But comment, thank you so much. What's with the Angie? Comment, why, why so Angie? <laughs> Comet, why? Why are you so angry? <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh man. Yeah, I guess you're trying to you're trying to maintain that number one spot, aren't you? <laughs> Let's see here. Um Snack Speaks is on. Oh no, the sky. I think I'm gonna get rid of the. I'm, I'm definitely gonna get rid of the. Uh, hold on, everyone. Give me just a moment. That. Let me get rid of. Or. Oh goodness. Yeah, we're gonna have to adjust things. Give me a moment. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Where is it? Is it here? Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna turn off the ragdoll physics for right now, everyone. Uh, no ragdoll, <laughs> no no ragdoll during stream. No no no, we're not we're not doing that. <laughs> not this stream. We're 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 just gotten we've just gotten back onto this avatar. We're not gonna be doing that. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Let me put myself back in the center again. I'm gonna have to readjust this avatar too. Hold on. Is it in here? Just oh goodness! Ah! <laughs> Back up, up and away! <laughs> And it, I'm just trying to adjust, I'm just trying to adjust things so that my tail doesn't get cut off or anything like that. Um, let's see, <laughs> let's see here. Here we go. We're making live adjustments here because you know there's some new new things about me, you know. But I'm not gonna say a word. Not a, not not a single word. No no no. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, welcome to the. Tonight, we are going to be reading Nine Lords of Night. I am so excited to be reading this book. Uh, let's see if we can get my arms working, too. Hold on. Let's let's try it out. Let's try it out. We can see what we can get. Um, I'm just going to ask. Hold on. My mic. Has my mic been muted this whole time? No, it's not. Some Okay. Something's not working. Give me a second, everyone. All right, let's try that again. Uh, 
Let's see if we can get that working again. Something's just not right with my stream deck. Let's see here. We're 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 trying to get all the kinks out. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Okay, now 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 it's now it's communicating. Now now it's communicating. All right. So everyone, hello. <laughs> Hello everyone, and again, welcome to Doki Doki Donuts. I am DB, your host. Uh, let's see if. Oh right, we're gonna get. Let's see if we can get my hands to uh, work as well. So, ah, that, ah, 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 my hands are working, everyone. All right. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and go into Nine Lords of Night for our story time. And now I've been really excited to read this book to all of you. I don't know about you, snacks, but we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be reading nine nine lords of night. Um, I think I need to move snacks somewhere a little bit less obstructive. Roku, hey Roku, welcome, welcome to the stream. All right, we're gonna move snacks, buddy. Buddy, you're gonna be you're kind of a little in the way. The so snacks, we're gonna. We're gonna put you here, bud. We're gonna put we're gonna put snacks right here, right right next to me. It's like he's he's right there, and all of you can still talk to snacks and still see snacks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> your favorite dragon tour. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I see you've noticed. Yes, my uh, pauldron, my 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 shoulder pauldrons are back, but they are now where they're supposed to be. A lot more quality of life, better for me, better for you. It's like it's out of the way. You can all see uh, <laughs> my actual design, but they are back. I my my big shiny shoulder horns are now floating up back behind me. So uh, yeah, no, it's gonna it's gonna be a good thing. Uh, you're gonna get to really see um what they do uh in vr chat once we finally have that full release and uh binary hey ah. all right so um <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and mute the discord so that way you guys can say what you want and i can read and uh but yeah so here we go everyone nine lords of night by by author cesar torres cesar torres was the same author that uh wrote 13 secret cities so this is book two but if my fingers can do it book two 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 there we go book book crunch fingers <laughs> book two of the coil novel series we are very excited and we're gonna go ahead and read it so here we go i'm gonna start off with the introduction and let's go A curious thing has happened to me in the past four years. I find, uh, oh, sorry, actually, be, oh, before I forget, if you do exclamation point H-O-M in the chat, you uh, if you want to get, uh, go ahead and start reading book three, uh, you can sign up on the link. So yeah, there's that. And why am I frozen? I do not know why I'm frozen and I'm not moving. There we go. <laughs> I'm more I'm more centered. If I'm gonna be frozen, at least I'll be right here. <laughs> so okay, a curious thing happened to me in the past four years. I find myself being swept downward in a circular kind of motion, headed down a place that is both strange but familiar at the same time. It's a dizzy it's a dizzying ride, thrilling and light, as if I were riding on the back of giant birds. I know the place we, were, we are headed. It's a place at the end of a deep spiral. The place is called, that place is called the coil. But the coil has a much older name. The Aztec Empire called it Miklan, a place the Aztecs also known, a place the Aztecs also known as Mexica or Mexica, Considered just as real as you and I consider the Eiffel Tower today. To the Aztec culture and mind, this was 
an underworld, a place of darkness where souls traveled on their journey after physical death. Miklan, or The Coil, is a place I created in my debut novel, 13 Secret Cities, which was which published in 2014. In the vast canyon, the size of millions of galaxies dwell gigantic snakes, pyramids made of talking flowers, and if you know how to get there, the dwelling place of the god and goddess of death. Today you hold in your hands the sequel to 13 Secret Cities, titled Nine Lords of Night, and I am proud to inform you that this is officially now a series that will follow this that will follow this story across several novels and other artistic works. It is for this reason that I have officially named this series The Coil. Arden! Really? Really, Arden? Really? Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, but there's there will be no... Uh, so happy Pride, everyone. Here we go. Uh, okay. Now that I have you here at the pre precipice over darkness, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. Relax. You'll get used to the darkness with your eyes. Your eyes will adjust. I am not I am not sure if you may like the people and creatures you encounter, but they for sure will not want to let you go. Cesar Torres, Chicago, August 2018. Go. Acknowledgements. This book was would not have been possible without the love and support of what has now been has now has become the team behind Solar Six books and my novels. First, I want to thank my parents for believing in me and no one else could or would. They know the path I have chosen as an artist, and I wish all parents could let their children fly free and the way they have. I also want to thank the following Patreon subscribers who have stuck with me over time. Gregory Myers, who gets his name used in character in Nine Lords of Night because of his level of sponsorship. Additional thanks to sponsors Norma Carmona, Angelica Carmona, Beth Saba, Derek Jackson, Todd Fleming, and Matthew Saba. I also want to thank all my first readers, starting with Rob Tolar or Rob Toller, Ayer Price, and Matt Saba, who have been there to witness the evolution of my work over the years and who have provided key feedback throughout. A story has to move, yo. <laughs> my conversations with Julie Callahan were also invaluable in developing this novel. She is a true inspiration. Huge thanks to readers Tom Malinowski, Deborah Douglas, Carla Ebo, and Melissa Bright. All right, here we go, everyone. Here we're starting the story now. <laughs> and since I'm apparently stuck, we're gonna turn off. Uh, we're gonna turn off the leap motion. Uh, because I cannot, for some reason. I'm not being captured. All right, let me see here. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm I'm moving again. It's got me. <laughs> Do you got me, camera? Can you see me? Are you winning, son? <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, hey, how's it going? How's it going to wolves and a jackal? Who I accidentally called two wolves in a jacket the other day. All right, so I had to drink some water. All right, here we go. We're starting off. Ch I guess this is chapter one. Day one, October 20th, 2025. Manhattan, 3.59 a.m. ET. Eastern time, I guess. All right, here we go. Marlene grew. Marlene grew drifted in a dreamless dark until a shriek woke her up. Night greeted her. The muscular body lying next to her changed shape, bulging and twisting beneath the sheets. It elongated with a violent thrust of a leg, 
Then it shrank, and after a moment, it stopped moving. Its breathing rumbled, then whispered. Marlene patted the head through the white sheet. And then the shriek returned, filling the high ceilings of her bedroom. Nora, baby, it's just my wife calling. Brian croaked from under the sheet. This bed was a sacred place for Marlene and Brian. Under these linen sheets, she was no longer his manager at the, at the law firm. And he was... And he was not her subordinate. Here they were equals. Partners. Inseparable. Marlene kicked off the sheets and stood up. The breath of the control... Uh, oh no, the breath of the central air conditioning made her skin break out in goose flesh. Phone calls at this time of night could only mean one thing. Someone had died. She thought about her mother in Florida, old Nessa, as everyone called her. And she stashed $50 bills inside... And how she stashed $50 bills inside coffee cans in her house so she could keep her up her cigarette habit without using credit cards. Maybe tonight, that shriek was the phone ringing, announcing old Nessa's second stroke. This could be a f the fatal one, the final chapter in a long, complicated story of a woman who would, who would never be satisfied with her husband, her daughter, or life itself. Could be. Or, ha or perhaps it was a call from Marlene's sister, Lilith. Maybe when Marlene picked up the line, Lilith would announce that her daughter, Paris, had been in a broad road accident. Paris would have slammed shots at the bar with friends, with no des designated driver, dead a twisted heap of metal at the bottom of a sharp turn in her college town. Paris would be slumped over the wheel of a Honda Civic, forever youthful, Marlene's favorite niece. Maybe. Or maybe the call was from Thaddeus' housekeeper, letting Marlene know that her ex-husband was finally dead from complications from diabetes. Of course, the real cause was beneath the diabetes, Thaddeus' never-ending relationship with Maker's Mark. If she picked up the line, she would learn that Thaddeus was dead, fat, and even in death forever attached to Marlene's life like a shadow or a parasite. She felt around the top of the dresser for her smartphone. She found the flat object and clicked the non-existent button, existent button on the side. The, the device shifted and unfolded like a flower, revealing a tiny screen on its center. No messages, no calls. The ringer was turned off and the phone was set to do not disturb mode. The shriek was not coming from the device. And next to her, Brian's iPhone, also dark. A third shriek cut through the dark, through the silence. Where in the hell is that coming from? She said to herself. Marlene stepped in front of the full length mirror in her room and she appreciated the way the night gave her black skin a bluish hue like ink. Her legs were a little thicker in the thighs and they were 10 years than they were 10 years earlier, but they remained strong and elegant. Her flat stomach gave her a youthful veneer, but the truth was that she didn't feel as energetic as she did in her 20s. She shook her head in the black mirror and made her way back toward the bed. Another shriek cut out in the night. This time, the sharp sound seemed to be coming from outside rather than inside the bedroom. Marlene yanked the blinds and at the center window, the cord fought her. She tugged a second time and the blinds rose. Light flooded her bedroom. Columbus Square sparkled in the distance, and the green canopy of Central Park spread out before her. The park's orange lights washed away the shadows in the room, and she waited in the silence, 
peering down at the winding taxi cabs in the streets. The roar of the city, the car horns, the ripped of wheels on asphalt. The, those sounds m massaged her ears. She looked down and gasped and recoiled from the windowsill. Oh, hell no, Marlene spat. A bird perched on the ledge of the building, looking right up at Marlene, staring right at her, into her. The bird was easily the size of a turkey, or maybe even a vulture, and its plumage shimmered like jewels. Its head feathers sparkled with blue and gold, and its belly and back shone in a deep metallic scarlet, like red garland on a tree at Rockefeller Center. Even under the bluish LED lights of the city, it was clear this animal was no pigeon, sparrow, starling, or any city bird that she knew of. Its beak rounded over its face into a razor-sharp point, and she was grasping for the word, for the name to describe this creature, because she had seen an animal like this before. Yes, a macaw. It was a fucking macaw. And its eyes, its curious, uncanny eyes, glittered like pools of water under the moonlight. But something was wrong with those eyes. Very wrong. It had two of them on each side of its head, and they looked wrong, corrupted, not of this world. Birds weren't supposed to have four eyes. The creature opened its beak, shrieked, emanating the infernal ringtone that had woken Marlene up. She tried batting the bird away. Thanks, Roku. I did, I did, uh, I did, uh, hydrate. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Marlene up. She tried batting the bird away with a hand, but it was much too large to be frightened off. Get the hell out of here, she said. The bird craned its neck, widened its four eyes, and croaked a single word, silky and elongated. Marlene. She stifled a scream and her blood ran cold. 4.17 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The bird's four eyes cascaded with pinpoints of light, like galaxies, solar systems, stars, and asteroids. Marlene had never seen an animal in any zoo or anywhere in the world, really, with eyes like these. For a moment, Marlene forgot who she was. She forgot where and when she was. The animal smelled of pine needles and incense. Suddenly, Marlene genuflected. She did it reflectively, out of pure muscle memory, just like she had learned to do in her days at St. Vincent's School. The bird cocked its head up toward Marlene and screamed its ringtone song. She could see that its mouth was not like the mouth of any macaw she had ever seen. Silvery barbs on the bird's tongue stood on end as if it was lined with sewing needles and the shiniest metal of the shiniest metal the needles bristled and squeaked like rusted wheel Marlene. oh no sorry Marlene, get your ass back to bed brian shouted from the inside of inside the bedroom something rough scraped marlene's knee and she lost her balance she stared down at her hand and gasped as she saw what she had been doing. Marlene was on hands and knees on the cement lip of the building when she had crawled on her hands and knees on... No, when had she crawled on her hands and knees on the ledge? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Her hair hung over the vast heights of her high-rise apartment, pointing down towards the sidewalk. If she had lost her center of balance now, she would topple 25 stories to her death. Below her, New York City spun like a roulette wheel, and nausea strummed inside her belly. The bird took a few slow steps toward her. Now that she was closer to it, she could see deep slits in its breast, like gills of a sh on a shark. 
They opened and closed as if they were breathing through them. Marlene crawled backward toward the window into her apartment, genuflected once more, once again, dazed. What do you want? she said. It only stared at her now, silent, as if her questions had angered it. She shut the window immediately and scurried back to bed and burrowed herself beneath the covers after a few moments in the which she tried to calm herself down she peered out from the blankets the animal was still there at the window staring at her through the glass marlene's hands fumbled on brian's body they found his shoulders and then his elbows and she slid into him to, and to give to give him a bear hug his heartbeat was strong slow calm she felt a little better brian you awake now I am, he said. He rolled his athletic body onto hers. I need, I need to make sure I'm not dreaming. Ooh, you're not dreaming. Did you hear the, ring fo the phone ring earlier? Yep, yep, I told you, just ignore her. No, it wasn't your wife. Your phone never rang. Brian grumbled. He kissed her once on the mouth and then slid out of the bed. He stood naked facing the windows, his erect posture and the way in which he pointed his feet straight out, reminded her of divers at the Olympics. He had snapped fully awake. He turned on the light switch on the wall and drew back the curtains to let more city lights into the room. I do see something out there. Want me to take a look? Told you. Should we call the super? Honey, it's the middle of the night, and besides, look. The bird had wandered into the center of the windows, as if it, if it needed the people inside the apartment to view it. It turned around and looked out into Central Park. It spread its wings, and they unfurled to an impossible length, more than six feet from end to end. For a moment, Brian and Marlene drank in the colors of Ruby. Jade, obsidian, sapphire, and other precious stones with no name. The wings shook, and the bird flew off into the sky. As it tore into the air, it left behind a streak of red and orange sparkles like fireworks. Gorgeous, Brian said. Marlene was shaking. Did you see that crazy shit? She said. The sparks? I just saw a tropical bird, probably just an escaped parrot from Central Park Zoo. What did you see? He stroked her hair, but she pushed his hand away. That was not normal, Brian. He said, see, no bad dreams and no calls for my wife. Just you and I losing precious sleep before a long day at the office. A big day. He took her, he took her in his arms and kisses and his kisses made her forget for a few moments. Still have time to undo this mess. You can still cancel his promotion, she thought. Pull the plug. Brian's stone hard profile, the jet of his brow, his full lips, and the softness of his intoxicating and uh, of his soft uh, of his eyes intoxicated her thinking. I owe you so much, she said. You're my mentor and someone just so special. So her mind went to a place she didn't like, to a dark thought. She pushed him away at the peck, using her just her fingertips. You should stay at your own apartment tonight, Marlene said. Come on, girl, take control. Send the boy home. Cancel his promotion. Defer it. Whatever it takes. Let him climb his way up the ladder another, on another side of the house. Not on your front porch. Brian clicked his tongue, reached over the wall, turned the lights off, and shook his head at her. No, I'm staying with you, Marlene. You said she monitors everything you do. But our time as a married couple is up, baby. I've been telling you that for a long time. Soon I won't have to worry about her. And I can only worry about us here they were like clockwork the promises 
from a married man. Marlene didn't want any of them. She had seen enough of her girlfriends and female relatives fall for the trap. I like how things are between us right now. You have your place, I have mine, and tonight you can take your car back to your to sleep on your own. You can't be serious. I just want to have something big, something special. I want us to make a life together. I don't want marriage or a life. I already attempted to make a marriage with Thaddeus, and look how things turned out there. Brian slid his hand under her breasts, and he kissed her mouth, and the sheets flowed back over their bodies. She relished the wetness of his lips, the ghost of pomade, and the ghost of pomade in his hair, short hair. Brian nuzzled Marlene's arms, her neck, and she, in turn, explored his body in the dark, high up above in this tower up in the Upper West Side. Time moved too fast when he <clears throat> her with his mouth, and she wished she could slow down, let it pass more carefully through her, but the electricity gave her came on subtly like a flash, and she moaned while grasping his hair. Brian squeezed her back with his hands, and Marlene caught a glimpse of the bedroom windows. He had forgotten to pull the blinds down, and the windows reflected part of their image back like a mirror. A tangle of pillows, sheets, arms, and breasts in silver and blue. She didn't like what she saw. Her twist twisted her hips in the bed so she could turn away from the windows. He pressed his He pressed himself onto her body, but before she could let him continue, she pulled away. The blinds, she said. Ungluing herself from Brian, she walked over to the windows. She was afraid to get close, afraid to see the alien-like bird with the galaxy eyes. But the sill and the ledge were empty. It was gone. Nevertheless, she pulled the shades down. Marlene tiptoed back to the bed and she got lost in the combined breathing and tangled and, and the tangle of her own hair in her mouth. Mm -mm. Things happened. Yada yada. Let me like fast forward because there are some adult things that I can't read. Oh, must be here. And his hands that never stopped exploring her curves. Uh, he switched roles and then exploring every portion of her skin, pressing his her face. And and they had sex. All right, her breathing, yeah, it's very spicy. A little, this part wasn't just a little too spicy for Twitch. Sorry, sorry, can't read it. Uh, let's see here, we're moving on. Her breathing sped up and the heat rose to the top of her head. As time raced, she approached. Uh -huh. She felt a touch of regret at the same regret she had about promoting the man she was sleeping with. And regret about the chain of decisions. She made a life. <clears throat> she made life. She had made in life that had left her successful, wealthy, and utterly lonely. The swell of tingling and anticipation in her body swooned, blotted out those thoughts, and for a brief few seconds, she was free from the aches inside her, free of the longing and suffering, and free from thoughts about monsters at her window. As she, <clears throat> for a second time, she remembered what had happened on the ledge and she broke out in goose flesh. The bird had spoken her name as if it knew everything about her. Okay, so I'm going to need to get some more water, everyone. Uh, I will be right back with some more of, apparently, this very spicy book. Oh boy. I will be right back, everyone. <laughs> If it were to work. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know. I know. Here we go. Uh, we're going to we're gonna try this again. Why is it not working? Let me first give myself 10 minutes. Are sitting at five. Let's see. 
here. All right, and I will be back in about 10 minutes.
All right, I'm back, everyone. <laughs> Let me see if I can get the camera to uh, see me again. No? Are you going to see me? I'm talking. Well, no, no, I'm talking to my camera. I'm just trying to see if it'll recognize that I'm here. Ah, hello, camera. <laughs> I guess it's not. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering why, what it, why it's not recognizing me. Um, oh well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what we're gonna do? Uh, oh, excuse me. That burp. So what we're gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna go really quick, and uh, go into our little oopsie. I will fix this and be, I mean, I'm going to unfortunately have to turn off the, uh, the avatar for now until we can figure out what's going on with the camera now, why it's not seeing me, but, uh, yeah, I will be right back. So that way we can uh, continue with some more spicy, uh, nine Lords of night. You know what? Let's just go into the Ooh door. I mean, cause yeah. I needed to do was threaten the camera that was going to turn it off, you know, and take the avatar away. And then ta-da, I'm moving again. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I know. Yeah, it, that's, that's how you, I'm going to take you away. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let binary toy with you. No, um, but all of you can't hear what's going on in the discord and that's fine. Um, let's see here. All right. So where did we last? All right, right, right. Let me, let me also put a bookmark here. Delete this bookmark and delete this book there. Okay. I mean, I was, look, I was not expecting this book to be so spicy. I, I, look, I I apologize that I couldn't read the words for word in that section, everyone. But this is Twitch, and it's later going onto YouTube's, and I don't want to get <clears throat> first for reading spas, spicy content, spicy while being a dragon. You know, I don't want to get in trouble for being spicy while being a dragon. Um, it was. I mean, I, look, look, it's, it's bad enough that, you know, th that they can't, uh, they can't take the fact that I am not just gay, but hella gay. Um, and you know, the little, that I've got, and I've got my little gay pride parade, like over here in this little corner over here that you can see behind me. Um, but anyway, so yeah, spicy. By the way, if you all don't, uh, if, uh, if y'all don't know, you can use your channel points to make snacks. Yeah, my snacks is that's my that's my ghost. Oh, sorry, Bina binary is asking me if my ghost was an, a literal donut, and uh, yes, that is that is that is that is, that is snacks. But that's my ghost, snacks. But snacks, but 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 snacks can speak. Everyone, snacks can speak. You just got to use, you just got to use your channel points to make snacks speak. Now, make sure you follow to TOS, everyone. If I can't read spicy content as a dragon, you can't write it. Okay, let's just, let's just make sure we make sure, make sure that we follow those rules. Okay, let's make sure we follow those rules. All right, so we, we just make sure you follow the rules 
and you know and we'll be okay we will be all okay all right so apparently it's not seeing me anymore again but at this point okay you know what uh, hold on everyone hold on hold on hold on we're going to uh We're going to have to swap. Sorry, everyone. We're going to have to swap. So give me just a moment. I'm going to disappear for a second. I open more than doors. I open shops too. Yes, you do snacks. Yes, you do. You do open. You do open shops as well. Uh, all right. So now that. Now that we're on this avatar, uh, we're on the PNG tuber. Um, this is going to be a little. Uh, so I apologize for everyone that that's planning on doing the other redeems. I am going to go ahead and turn those off, so you don't spend your sprunks on things that aren't available. So uh, let's turn off. Oh no, the sky. Let's turn off. Let's turn off. Pride Parade. Pride Parade. That, one, that one's turned off. Okay, there we go. All right, so th now you don't have to worry about your little, about your points not being, you know, that weren't available. Also, just to let everybody know, I did adjust when the uh, commercials come in. I apologize. And there goes a commercial. I, I can see when the commercials are. So what I'm going to, I'm going to wait until the commercial's done. I'm I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait because I I'm gonna need to say this so that people understand um why I'm gonna start forcing commercials on stream. I should have done it when I was on break though. I should have done it's on break. I'm I'm waiting for the commercial to be at to end everyone. If you got a subscription that's great and you can and you can hear me but i do apologize i know the commercials on my channel are very interruptive especially when i'm trying i'm trying to answer people's questions about certain things and well you know I i'm gonna ask though uh blizz was the stream stable while the avatar was on Okay, I just heard from Blizz that it, that was a yes, that the stream was perfectly stable. So what that means is that my dumbass had my <laughs> my VTuber Plus on way too high of a resolution. All right, so we're gonna try this again. I'm gonna open I'm gonna open my programs again to see if we can fix the uh, camera issue. I just didn't want to be an invisible face. All right. All right, so I'm going to explain this from now on on the stream. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, on breaks. I'm going to be running three minute ads because what that does, it'll pause the automatic ads, the pre-roll ads for about 10 minutes. So we'll have 10 minutes of uninterrupted stream and whatnot or 30 minutes. I, I don't know. I think it's 30 seconds for 10 minutes. Well, you know what? It'll it'll temporarily pause the pre-roll ads. Um, I did have it set to do the pre-roll five minutes in to joining the stream. Um, but yeah, so just know that that's gonna be an experience for everyone. Uh, let's see here. Let me start the program again. See here. Do you see me, camera? Uh, okay, now it's moving me. All right, so let's move this down here. All right, and then now uh, let's get our pro our get VTuber Plus open again. Oh nope, that's Discord. That is not Steam. That is Steam. All right, here we go. All right, let's start up VTuber Plus again. Right. Oh, geez. 
<laughs> well, I'm logging in to myself, everyone. All right, let me hide myself again. There we go. There we go. There we go. And the center me again. All right. There we go. I'm, I'm back. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm back. All right, there we go. I'm moving again. All right. So now we're going to go back to reading Nine Lords of Light, everyone. Um, it's now 7.31 a.m. ET. I have to Facebook my old Morehouse crew. No, I have to I have to Facebook my old Morehouse crew, Brian said. To let them know what a big day this is. He was feigning surprise in front of all his peers at the firm, but genuinely happy. Thrilled. Marlene understood that Brian had to go through these motions. A long time before she had done this too, citing New NYU's Black Alumni Network at her alma mater to prove a point, to assert herself, to make herself be seen. Brian's Morehouse statement was mostly directed just at Marlene, the other only black person in the room. She could not imagine what Morehouse College meant to the rest of the partners at Morton and Morton, nor does she care. Let's see here. Another coup for your alumni, Marlene said. She did her best to fill her words with a congratulatory tone, but this morning there was a flatness in her voice she could not suppress. Marlene sat on at the farthest end of the boardroom, strategically as far away from her lover as she could, in order to not draw any attention to them as a pair. Between her and Brian sat three more partners, Albert Morton, Quentin Morton, his father, and Scott White, who had become partner just a year ago. Marlene had worked as an associate 20 years before making partner in 2010. Today, Brian Berger joins our ranks, Quentin said. His promotion to partner arrives early in his career, just barely three years after his arrival here in our Midtown office. Your drive, tenacity, and ability to articulate complex legal matters into simple language for more cl major clients have paid off, said Quentin Morton through his white mustache. It is truly an honor, Brian said, and one of the hungriest. Indeed, Brian hungered for prominence, influence, and there was so much of herself, her younger self, that 20 years before that Marlene saw reflected in his ambitions. Of course, that, similarly, this, that similarity ends in other ways. Brian was not a woman, and he hadn't known the shitty things the men at this firm had said to her over the years, or the sideway glances she had gotten from other female attorneys and staff, nor the endless battle for salary that came with her, the ownership of, her, of ovaries and female hormones. No, Brian had no idea. He did understand Marlene in some significant ways. He perhaps could see why the color of skin seemed to matter so much to most people and the ways it could distort and warp a career. Being black meant that every conversation with a white colleague would always teeter on the edge of some unspoken truth, a hidden set of words that lurked beneath the surface, and every politically correct statement would sting at least one of the parties involved. In fact, Marlene just waited for one of the other partners, probably Albert, the youngest Morton, to make some awkward comment about diversity this morning to drive the point home that there was, after all, a progressive, thoughtful point to be made out of color of a person's skin. Only one of Brian's parents was black, but most people he came into contact always thought he was just plainly black. 100% black. At least that was how Brian put it to her when they shared dinner. And, on, and wine on nights they got together. But there was another truth to what he said. His lighter skin, creamy like coffee and cream, was palatable to many people, including the men in the firm. If he was much blacker, she wondered how well these stuffy white men would get along with him. If he, 
If we read as too black, we scare people away, Marlene thought. After a silent pause in her line of thought, after thought arrived hard and fast, fuck all these people. Now Morton and Morton had its diversity, a woman of color and a man of color. Sure, lots of other puzzles, pieces were missing, but her peers had enough to brag on the professional associations up to the professional associations for a good half decade with this promotion. The irony that was that Marlene respected these attorneys she worked with and she thoroughly enjoyed working with them. But that didn't take away the fact that they had hurt her many times and reminded her of her days as a girl when she had first started to understand how her kinky hair and dark skin were vectors in American society. Vectors that sent her careening into directions that could not control. She could not control. She had learned this in the early 80s when Marlene rode in a car with her father, the air conditioner blasting icy air on high and headed toward Atlanta to visit relatives. Those were the days when the cops pulled the family over on road trips along I-75 and shone a light into her eight-year-old face as evening started to set and she first heard the phrase, you people. Nothing was perfect and no one was perfect. And Marlene knew that, but it seemed nowadays like no one was trying to improve relations in any significant way. What the fuck do I even bother for? She thought. Albert Morton leaned forward in his chair. You've always known. You know, you've always had the best nose for new highs, Marlene. Thanks. The younger Morton was hard to read. Marlene often wondered if his remarks were small digs at her. I envy your life. You know that. My life isn't all that rosy. Trust me, she said. She began to dig her nails into her thigh into the thigh of her skin of her business suit into the thigh of her business suit the pain that bloomed on her skin felt good come on you're in a great position here at the firm you have that kick-ass co-op please have another dinner party soon please and i'm sure you'll have a long list of men waiting to have dinner with you oh quentin said reprimanding his son with a single word no it's it's okay quentin Marlene said i can respond to that being on the dating market in manhattan as a woman in her 50s is not the paradise you'd expect it's opposite in fact you're serious about that statement eh albert said plus i'm black awkward silence seeped into the room she was so fucking tired of it but it had to be said Let's get out of, let's get on with our day, shall we? Quentin said. We can talk more over dinner to celebrate. They filled they filed out of the conference room and she kept her distance at least six feet from Brian as she moved past the threshold. Inside she felt dead. Wooden. Today was one of those days when Manhattan felt more like a prison than anything else. 803 AM ET. The men stood up and filed out of the conference room. Brian's eyes stopped for a moment at the swell of Marlene's breast through her blouse. Brian was so careless, playing games, flirting with disaster. She walked through the threshold before it got any worse and raced into her office. She skimmed the subject lines in her email and she felt her body grow thin and tiny. A black Alice in Wonderland inside a 40-story building that housed Morton and Morton. She couldn't answer a single email without feeling a knot in her gut. She stepped out of her office and into the tiny hall in the back row of executive offices that slid her key and slid her key into the bathroom. She put her head down into the porcelain sink and waited for vomit that never came. She sprinkled cold water on the back of her wrists and touched her makeup, touched up her makeup as she reset the powder on her face. She fell into a memory that she hadn't visited in a long time. More than 30 years earlier, her father had taken her to a haunted house in the suburbs of Atlanta. 
when she used to visit him around holidays while she was an undergrad at NYU. It was just her and him, both of them always suspicious of one another, but friends nonetheless. <clears throat> Sorry, getting all froggy there for a second. Let me take another sip. She had turned 19 the week before and then drove to Sandy Grove, an abandoned campground that featured a haunted house for the month of October. Marlene didn't like haunted houses, but he had insisted. At the attraction, the attraction was run by a black family, and this was a good thing, she, he said to her. We need more businesses like this, he said. He had said, snorting quick bursts of laughter as he drove off the highway and onto the side roads. Think of what this could mean for the unsuspecting white folk who come through here. They'll get the scare of their lives from black folks, and this time they'll pay them cash to top it all off. As they drove through the gates of the old estate and parked their car a few a hundred feet away from the campground, Marlene could smell the liquor on her brother on her father's breath. He always drove drunk. About half of the teens and families that parked in the lot had been white, and the other half black. They waited, they waited in line to pay the $20 fee to enter. A father squeezed her hand as they climbed rickety stairs that still smelled of sawdust and wood glue. As they rose, they visited rooms where the undead rose from the morgue, a church where a demon slithered from, from around the altar to swipe at their ankles, and a mock motel room that led into a, a white bathroom where a shower ran with real running water and a figure waited around the corner to yank the curtain and stab them. Marlene clawed at her father's forearms with her nails as she screamed each time the demon scarecrows and zombies lunged at them. Halfway through the haunted house, they had to walk across a field from the farmhouse to the grain mill and the flat piece of land had been decorated like a graveyard. As Marlene's sneakers stepped into the muddy ground, she realized that she was having a lot of fun, and her father's problems with gambling debts and his unwillingness to back off from alcohol didn't seem much to matter much. Didn't seem to matter much, at least for a few moments. They walked through the doors of the grain silo, and her father led the way with confidence. And no matter how suddenly a specter or a masked killer jumped out at them, he never screamed or flinched. In fact, he hummed along as they traveled through the silo, delighted by Marlene's screams. They walked through a dark room in which they could hear a snake hiss. From above, the creature's eyes lit up in bright blue light and spit from the flickering, and spit from the flickering tongue showered them as she screamed. In the upper flo floors, a skinny werewolf, bare except for a loincloth, but wearing a giant dog's head, lunged at them so he could snatch them into the world of the dead. And y'all give me a moment, please. I don't know what happened, everybody, but it just put us back to the opening screen. I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> but, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I had my tablet talking behind me, and it just started to get on my freaking nerves. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, whoa, I am moving. I am moving again. Uh, 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 there we go. We're back. <laughs> there we go. And let's see here. Okay, Marlene screams. Let's see here. Okay, uh, we're going to read this again. In the upper floors, a skinny werewolf, bare except for a loincloth, 
but wearing a giant dog's head, lunged at them so he could snatch them into the world. I'm uh, sorry, excuse me, everybody. I, I need to I need to shut down my tablet because it just doesn't want to shut up. Give me a moment. There we go. Okay, I'm back, and the camera will see me in just a moment, hopefully. There we go. It now sees me. Oh, no, I had to I had to shut it up because the Siri would not stop activating every time I talked about the, dog, the dog's giant head. And for some reason, somewhere in that line, I thought I was saying its name. So I'm like, no one is talking to you. <laughs> and so... All right, so here we go. Uh, here, here we go, everyone. So we're we're back. Uh, we're gonna read that line again. Apparently, must have been the line "skinny werewolf." Uh, <laughs> apparently, Siri is a skinny werewolf, everyone. Um, so, <laughs> oh, I have an Australian male voice for mine. So, mm, yeah. All right, so here we go. Uh. Once again, let's go back to, in the upper floors, a skinny werewolf bear except for a loincloth, but, but wearing a giant dog's head, lunged at them so he could snatch them into the world of the dead. Toward the end of the ride, they tiptoed through a hallway filled with the sounds and projected images of birds. They descended once more along creaking wood stairs, and the sounds of the birds grew loud enough to drown out the world. As they neared the exit, an invisible trapdoor popped open, and a flock of pigeons burst into the room. Marlene felt feathers, thousands of feathers around her, and screamed. And she felt, and she grabbed her father by the arm, leading him straight toward the door marked exit. They ran out into the field, and she was still screaming, imagining the birds had cut her face, her lips, tang tangled their talons in her hair, and that they had done the same to her father. As the cool night kissed their foreheads outside the haunted house, Marlene realized she was safe, in fact, intact, and so was her father. He laughed and tugged her afterward, he bought cheeseburgers, fries, and a bag of boiled peanuts for each of them. And they ate in his car while Marlene played one of her CDs in the car's stereo. I had a good time, she said, and the Fugies blasted the Toyota Corolla with melancholy and rhythm. Hmm. He turned to her and laughed. You know, the people that get scared the most are the ones that have the most guilt in their heart. You do, you do know that, right, baby girl? He nodded toward the, the wide patches of farmland behind Sandy Grove. It was those fields where slaves had done labor. Sorry. It was those fields where slaves had done labor for the white owners in the, on those farms. You saying I should feel guilty about something? She spat. She tossed the rest of her meal in a trash bin in, in the empty parking lot and picked at her nails the rest of the way home. The silence between them grew tense, arid. She heard his words over and over. You know, the people that get scared the most are the ones that have the most guilt in their heart. You know that right, baby girl. But now, years later, in the luxury carpet bathroom, she realized she had been wrong about what her father said. That night in Atlanta, he had not been talking about the guilt of white people or her guilt. He was talking about his guilt. She reapplied powder to her face and avoided looking at her eyes in the mirror. 
And then she walked back to her office. She read an email subject line from the HR director called, Can you do a keynote on diversity and hiring practices this November? You would be perfect for this, Marlene. Marlene's cursor hovered over the reply button. Fuck this, she said to herself and shut down her email app. 8.40 a.m. E.T. Maybe I should end the affair, Marlene told herself. As she walked around in circles in her office, the idea sat in her mind and it spread like a virus growing, replica replicating itself. She and Brian had been sleeping together on and off for a full year now, and they had always been more than careful. If anyone ever found out, Marlene would lose her job. She was a senior partner, true, and she knew that the Morton family would provide her a solid level of protection from a scandal, but they would not perform miracles of God either. Marlene had been the person to lobby for pro Brian's promotions, his best spokesperson, his advocate. She knew better than anyone that else that allegations of sexual harassment against her would grind her career to a halt, and she would know better than anyone else it was her own fucking specialty. In the past decade, she had handled sexual harassment suits against Airbnb, Uber, Microsoft, and executives at Monsanto. Hell, she had worked on the Harold Weinberg case, leveled against one of the best-known Hollywood producers of the 21st century and won. She didn't think Brian would ever betray her, but if there was anything she had learned in her 25 years of experience is that when it came to sex and adultery, betrayal is always possible and more than likely. Most people had a burning need to confess, to have a release valve for their secret transgressions. And if Brian opened his mouth about the clandestine game after hours, it would be all over for her. She swiped in, inside of her desk for Pepto-Bismol, but only found a pack of gum. She couldn't exit the endless loop of ideas, the threats of a future that would also be bleak, so miserable. Her career was the one, the only solid structure she really had. And she was putting it all on the line. I can't stay here, she said out loud to herself. She flipped up the lid of her laptop and made sure the screen was left on with her email inbox proudly displaying its brimming contents. This would give the appearance that everything was moving along as usual. She took her handbag with, with her and left her coat draped on the chair. Suddenly ending the affair made the most sense and it ran in circles inside her mind. She couldn't let it go inside the elevator. She glanced at her, Sure, Arden. I will stop in the middle of my sentence to drink frickin' water. <laughs> Thanks for the redeem, Arden. Give me a moment. God damn it. Cut the mood like a knife, really. <laughs> Drink that agua. Uh, okay, here we go. Where, now, where was I? Oh, she couldn't let it go. Inside the elevator, she glanced at her reflection in the chrome. Her business suit, her armor, as she called it, was custom-made, folded over her athletic body and accentuated her curves, and her makeup, Chanel. But her eyes looked hollow, sullen, flat. You look like corruption, darling. No, sorry. You look like cor corruption, darling, she said. She glanced at her watch, only 8.45 a.m. She stepped onto 42nd Street and its cacophony. She had no idea where she was going to go, but her feet never stopped moving. Growing up, her father had told her there's only one direction to go. Forward. The vulgar consumerism of the LED walls of advertisements and the chain stores bombarded Marlene's eyes. Ads the size of buildings flashed before her. 
She took in the preview of The Gold Apocalypse, a new TV series on HBO dripping with the sexuality of men's semi-naked bodies and in superhero costumes. Beneath that screen, women in submissive poses got fondled by a horde of men in Amber Crombie jeans. On the next block, an expensive AI coffee maker provided a man and woman the most orgasmic cup of coffee ever. Defining and validating their lives in one sip. All the Gulliverian ads centered on the scale of youthful, attainable youth. To sell cosmetics, cars, and perfume. The seduction of children's souls with ads for movies and fast food. And this blanket of products and illusions became her perfect cover. She ducked into CVS and purchased six half bottles of Chardonnay. She opened one right in the store, not giving a shit, and slammed its contents in just a few swigs. The rest she jammed into her bottom, into the bottom of her shoulder bag. She exited the pharmacy and continued to walk west on 42nd Street. She let the wine guide her. 8.44 a.m. At the intersection of 7th Avenue and 42nd Street, military police performed routine bag checks. Men and women formed two neat but separate lines and opened their purses, backpacks, and shopping bags for the uniformed police. Marley no longer thought that these security checks were a big deal now that the drones floated above every single intersection scanning biometric IDs. Had she given up... Uh, Oh, she, had she given up on some ideal by accepting these checkpoints, by allowing her pockets and purse to be fair game for any officer of the law? If so, she had given up on the collective alongside millions of Americans who felt that as long as they got the experience of Disney, like magic, in, in, experience, uh, they got to experience the Disney-like magic of Times Square. This was a concession they could make. Oh, wait, I'm in telenovela mode. Damn. Oh, shit. Okay, uh, let me put the timer on. She realized the bird uh, with the galaxy eyes in her bedroom night before. Its eyes had twinkled like the LED billboards, <laughs> billboards that lit up the streets before her now. In all her life, Marlene had never cared for birds. They were awful creatures whose eyes stared out into the world from the sides of their heads. And yet, the eyes she had seen had felt different, foreign. Hey. The wiry cup standing before her slid, his sunglasses down on the snows, and took a look at her. His blue eyes bore into her. Hold it right, hold it there, he said. You're in quite a hurry. Suddenly she felt scared, as if she would be found out for sleeping with a man she just promoted at her firm. Yes, indeed, I intend to take... Yes, I didn't intend to take so long at my doctor's appointment, she said. I almost had an accident the night last night from sleepiness. Open your bag, please. She parted the leather lips of her designer handbag, and his hand reached with touching some of the items without shuffling them about. He glanced at the wine bottles just as she was trying to close the designer bag. You dash through Times Square like this often, miss? If you know you can't skip the line for bag checks, everyone has to comply. I didn't break any laws, she said, her eyes firm and defiant like her mother's. No, you, no, can't you say you have? Then am I free to go? And nothing is wrong, then. Of course not. I'm acting like I... Am I acting like I broke the law? Of, may I see your ID? He waved to, 
two other police and ask them to take the overflow of people waiting to go through the checkpoint. Excuse me, I don't see you asking for white people's IDs before they line up for security checks. She handed over her New York State driver's license. She knew she couldn't win in a situation like this. He flipped his sunglasses back on his face and inspected the card. She kept her lip pressed tight and her face stern, unmoving, yet her heart was racing. He handed the ID back without, uh, to her without saying a word. After she tucked it back into her wallet, she didn't walk. She ran away from the checkpoint. 8.46 a.m. E.T. Sorry, I have to be dramatic for another seven minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Hans pushed Marlene from behind. Sorry, someone said, and then laughed. A second shove, and a pack of teens marched on pushing her aside, and she lost her balance for a moment. Her ankle folded, and she stumbled toward the building on her left. They walked in a trio wearing chunky heels and flipping their long hair in waves of teal, gold, and purple. They laughed seemingly at nothing, their hands glued to their phones, and their teeth white as snow. Who the hell were these little bitches? These girls pushed forward, snapping phone photos on their phones and oblivious to the middle-aged woman in the power suit they had almost knocked over. Marlene reached out toward the wall of su for support and she stumbled onto the wall of LEDs. She regained her footing and looked Movie titles and showtimes formed a grid of black text on a white, on the bright, and on bright white. Of course, why didn't she think of it before? She read through the titles. Three Body Problem, Transformers 10, Return of Unicron, The Hateful Fiction, Lament Configuration, Hellscape. Edric Cody and the Pupa. The Godfather 2025. We share our mother's health. The Internet's best cat videos. And then this, this is all like all Greek letters. Uh, o I E. I don't know what these Greek. They say Oi. Oye. I, I don't know. I can't read this. I'm, re I'm in traumatic telenovela mode. Where all she needed was a proper start time. She hated missing the beginning of a movie. Her phone's notification system was already blowing up. She flipped up the screen and saw messages from her secretary and Brian looking for her. She should return the messages. Should she return the messages? But instead, she tucked the phone back into her purse. Only in New York could she get into a movie theater this early. Thank you, Manhattan. For keeping me comfortable. At the very end of the grid, she found a show time of 9, 10 a.m. For a movie called O.I.E. That's the one. 8, 57 a.m. Marlene walked into the lobby and bowed before the vending machine in front. One for OIE, she said. Uh, she said, "One for OIE," she said out loud, and slid twenty-five dollars through the glass slot. The printed ticket slid toward her through the slot, and a pre-recorded female's voice thanked her for her purchase, and a faint smile projected itself onto the glass like a Cheshire cat. The theater. Like most theaters in America, no longer employed ticket staff. The theater's vast lobby displayed nothing more than movie posters and two escalators led up into the heavens, promising popcorn, soda, hot dogs, and some of the best projection screens the city could offer. Marlene took the escalators up into second level of the multiplex. She bought a bottle of water at the concession stand. She was 
which was staffed by a human, this time a young black woman, no older than 20. Love your manicure, girl, the attendant said. Her hair was braided and tied back. Marlene looked down at the pearly sheen of the young woman's lacquered nails. Thank you. Thank you. Keep my claws pretty and as blue hummingbirds. Huh? Marlene said. What a strange thing to say. Keep my claws pretty as hummingbirds? It's a line from an old Beyonce song. Strange, I never heard of it, Marlene had heard the young woman say blue hummingbirds the first time. She had omitted it the second time. This attention to how people spoke made Marlene very good at her job. But today, in this vast and lonely cinema... The expression gave her a queasy feeling. Marlene smiled back and made eye contact at her hands ex as their hands exchanged cash and a plastic bottle. Marlene glanced over her ticket and took two more sets of escalators up to the top of the building. The escalators hum as she rolls into the building, glimpse, catching glimpses of 42nd Street, pouring into town square, throbbing like a desperate and overworked artery in a chambered heart. God, this is going to take you so long. As she rolls higher in the building, Marlene caught a stiff but pleasant smell, artificial and familiar, sweetish fish. She could have bought a box at the con concession stand. Damn it! Stop losing your stuff and make believe bullshit, Marlene's father had commented once as she scanned the newspaper listings for movie times during a holiday in her junior year of high school. He was already drunk. It was barely 1 p.m. He snatched his car keys from the table, tucked the newspaper under his arm, and walked out into the driveway. His red Chrysler. Oh, goodness. Oh, whoo. Good. Okay. Time's up. Okay. Oh, great. And now. Oh, take care, binary. <laughs> All right. So we're done with telenovela mode. Oh, jeez. That. That. That scared me. <laughs> Hold on. I have to. I have to fix my stream deck because it broke again. Um. For some reason, it just broke. It just decided to break. And I'm like, come on. Really? Come on. Yeah. All right. There we go. We're back. We're back to normal reading, everyone. We're back to normal reading. Hold on. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> oh, jeez. That was... That was 10 minutes of insanity, everyone. Hold on. I need to bookmark this page now. Leave the other bookmarks. Yeah, here we go. His red Chrysler peeled off down the street. The, com the comment had stung, but her mother had handed Marlene her jean jacket, and they drove... I, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it broke, but luckily the timer still kept going. So thanks for that. Because as soon as what's funny is that um, that was just it was just great. <laughs> Sorry, that dramatic reading, that overly dramatic reading was just a bit much for me also. Um. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, I don't know why it's not capturing me now. Well, I mean, you paid for telenovela mode. You're going to get telenovela mode. So as overly dramatic as possible. So, yeah. 
All right, so let's get back to where we were. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 where were we? The comment had stung, but her mother had handed Marlene her jean jacket, and they drove down to the pa Plaza Theater. That day, she had taken Marlene to see Field of Dreams. During those high school years, they watched anything they both wanted at the Plaza Theater in Atlanta. She and Old Nessa favored movies like You've Got Mail and Pretty Woman, as well as the yearly showing of religious epics like Ben-Hur. It was inside the walls of the, mo of the movie theater with its smell of the stale grease and Swedish fish that Marlene found the only neutral ground with her mother. No, go ahead. No, if you've got... It, look, you spend the points, it's gonna happen. I'm just saying, you spend the points, it gonna happen. So, if at any point you decide for another telenovela mode, it'll be telenovela mode again. Trust me, it's not taxing my voice. It's just mentally a little exhausting because I have to just, like switch to that mindset. Um, but hey, <laughs> hey, Cesar. Um, so hey, everybody. LED, just if you didn't know, LED Queens is Cesar Torres, the author of the Coil novel series. Uh, the not just not just um. 13 Secret Cities, but also Nine Lords of Night. Um, we just, we were not expecting, Cesar, we were not expecting how spicy this book was at the very top. Um, I had to not read, <laughs> I had to not read a good yeah, I had to not read a certain part. I had to like, oh, yeah, they were doing stuff. And, oh, boy. <laughs> As in, like, it's like, okay. And I like keep skipping through it. You're like, okay, are they done? Uh, we're going to read a little bit of this. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, they did the thing. And, uh... <laughs> I was I was honestly not expecting it be wow, that spicy. Hold on, let me see if I can get my camera to work again. No, it's not your fault at all. It is not your fault at all. Not at all. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking side to side, wondering what I could read. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was kind of like that. <laughs> what do I read? What can I read? Oh God! <laughs> well, now, just to let everybody know, if you, uh, LED just released book three of the Coil novel series. So if you're interested in signing up to read the web serial release of book three of the coil novel series all you got to do is do exclamation point h-o-m yeah yeah i know everybody else in the chat was going oh 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 but another heads up it's a crime book so some scenes get quite violent oh this one's a crime book Okay, so this is a true crime book, sort of. Okay. All right, so there, there you go, everybody. That, now you know. So I'm going to make sure that before every stream to just give everybody a fair warning that, that there is violence in, in this reading. Um, I might change some words to the more stream-friendly versions of words. So just, yeah. By the way, you just missed... Um, a telenovela mode reading of this book. So <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that, but yeah. But again, if you all want to sign up for book three, which is a free web serial novel, and um, just do exclamation point H O M in the chat, and you will get a link to be able to sign up to be part of the um serial release of Hall of Mirrors. So just do. Uh, if you could, once again, 
Uh, uh, uh blah, 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 blah. Blizz, would you mind please doing the doing the chat commands so everybody can see what it's like? Gonna bookmark here. And bookmark. Let's go here. All right. No, not social. H O M. Exclamation point H O M. There you go. That's how you can sign up for, for Hall of Mirrors. And trust me, uh, these books are good, everybody. I, I Look, I was not expecting the spiciness right at the beginning. But yo, yo. Oh. <laughs> oh, boy. I was not expecting it to get that spicy. I was like, look, first I was enthralled. I was enthralled by the freaking description of the bird. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're, they're going, wow, we're going at it. Okay, can't read that section. There's no way to read that section on stream. <laughs> all right, all right, so let's get back to this. Yeah, no, I know the bird is, well, the symbolism of birds. Now, I will say this. So far, regarding the nails... And the and the girl, we just got to the part in the movie theater where the girl mentions blue hummingbirds, and then she's talking. We just passed the whole part of the haunted house and whatnot, and all I could think of was blue hummingbird, the snake. When she mentioned, um, when she mentioned the uh, when when you when when we got to the blue the whole hummingbird comment to keep your claws bl blue like like a blue hummingbird and yeah, that bird with the four eyes, that macaw with the four eyes and the description of the semi-precious stones and whatnot. Yeah. No, well, the thing is that, um, yeah. Bl well, the thing is with like blue hummingbird left such an impression on me. She left such an impression on me that I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I might have, I might commission some art of, if you're okay with it. I want to commission art of a snake made out of many snakes with, with blue eyes. Um, it, well, we can talk about that later. Um, because that, I, I think Blue Hummingbird would make an amazing tattoo. Yeah, I think Blue Hummingbird would make an amazing tattoo, not going to lie. Um, because she left such an impression. Yeah, she she left such a such an impression that I might get a tattoo of, of Blue Hummingbird. Um, because she's just so cool. So, so freaking cool. Um, but yeah. Yeah, hands down, my favorite. Blue Hummingbird is my favorite. But anyways, let's get, let's get back to this. Um, oh, you, yeah. All right, so here we go. Um, let's see here. Uh, it was inside the walls of the movie theater with with its smell of stale grease and Swedish, Swedish fish, that Marlene found the only neutral ground with her mother. She reached the fourth floor and walked toward theater number 13. A man in a hoodie crossed in front of her, headed from the bathroom into one of the screening rooms. Marlene traced her hand along the wide windows and, and looked out onto the city. Gray, time-worn midtown with its veneer of newsness, courtesy of Starbucks and H&M. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, are these drones, the, by the way, the drones and the security checkpoints in New York, are they from that drone 
security thing that they did in 13 Secret Cities just years later and spread across the country? Are those the same drones? Or the same drone program? I knew it! I knew it! I had a feeling. I had a feeling when they were talking about drones that they were the same drones from Chicago. Okay. So it did. So the program did succeed and they spread it throughout the country. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, I, I caught that. I, I did catch that quickly. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, t -t 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 and there we go. It's screening rooms. Marlene traced her hand along the wide windows that, that looked out to the city. Gray, time-worn time -worn midtown with its veneer of newness, courtesy of Starbucks and H&M. Fake boobs, flawless clothes, and endless youth. What was her life going to be like in 10 years when she was 62? Why had she pushed herself so hard to become Marlene Grew, attorney for Morton & Morton, leader of multiple teams, winner of litigations, champion of severance packages, mother of none, she sighed. Marlene paused in front of the framed poster for the film. She was about, uh, for the film she was about to see, Samuel Hans. O-I-E. Am I, am, I, am, am I reading that right? Is it O-I-E? Because I don't know how to read that. That O with the, sli with the slash through it. Reading the lettering, a man's silhouette raced through along the uh, through a long hallway. He was framed in shadow, but nothing, nothing but a cutout. Above him, mosaic tiles created a vast archway bathed in gold and royal blue. Oh, oy a, okay. Oy a. Ah, uh, see here. And drawn was nothing but a science, but, but science fiction. The mosaic tiles doubled as lights on the control board or pixels on a computer screen. I have to get out too, brother, Marlene said, and tapped the glass on the poster frame with a manicured nail. She puts through the doors and the darkness of the cinema embraced her, swaddled her, took her in without judgment. It welcomed her back. Oh, it's word for I. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Oh, it's not Scandinavian. Okay. It's the word for I. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, wow. I shifted again. But but I, I hope you all can see the little pride parade going down the bottom of my screen. Here we go. Uh, just shift it again. Da, da, da. All right. Here we go. Let's see here. I have to get out of here too, brother, Marlene said, and tapped the glass on the poster with a manicured nail. She pushed through the doors, and the darkness of the cinema embraced her, swaddled her, took her in without judgment. It welcomed her back. She took, to a, she took a seat in the middle of the theater. The preview started. While the fiercest American brands showered her with their advertisements, she took a sip of her water and unscrewed a second bottle of Chardonnay. She welcomed the swoon with the swoon she was already feeling from the first bottle she had drunk at CVS. She smacked her lips. By the time the previews were done, she had already finished the second bottle and started on the third. From deep inside her bag, she pulled a white prescription bottle. She popped the Norco to give the wine a nice smooth edge. 9.09 a.m. Marlene knew it would be long before someone at Martin & Morning would be looking for her. She tapped on her email app and set up her out-of-office message. I'll be back in office at midday, October 26th. 
Let them assume she had a client meeting. She put the empty container into her purse and started working on the third bottle. Marlene, Marlene turned her phone off and tucked it into the darkest corner of her bag. Keep searching, darlings, she said into the empty theater. The Chardonnay was sweet as candy. It was so basic bitch and yet so delicious and all hers. As the movie titles glided down on the screens, beams of light, beams of light from the right side cut through the darkness. A wiry man took a seat a few rows directly in front of Marlene. Oh, that reminded me. Um, the description of the werewolf at the haunted house, at the black-owned haunted house. You know, it reminded me of Shalotl. Was that a reference to Shalotl? Skinny with a dog head and a loincloth? Because that's what it reminded me of every time when I read that. Yes! Okay, cool. See, I'm getting them. I'm getting them. I am getting them. <laughs> yes, I do. Because the snake, also the snake um, spitting down at them. Um, that reminded me of Blue Hummingbird as well, because of the description of the snake. And then um, also the birds flying at her reminded me of the smoky birds. Yeah, no, it, it, it was like, oh my gosh, these are like little, little nods to the previous book. But anyways, all right, here you go. Rose in front of Marlene, a vast ocean spread out on the screen and classical music swelled in the digital speakers the title cards flickered on their in their usual sequence cast editor director of photography and so on until the last card director samuel kahan marlene had always enjoyed kahan movies and she generally stayed up to date on the latest titles that floated in dinner conversations with friends on the weekend. And yet she had no idea what Samuel Kahan had released, uh, had released another film. In fact, she had thought that he had died a few years back. He was in his 70s, not at the very least, wasn't he? Oye wove two women's stories together across a time span of 20 days the narrator announced oh the narrator announced the young women a younger woman the younger woman a seamstress in a baghdad clothing factory brash on the verge of 19 years of age clashed with her mentor a woman in her early 70s who compromised nothing within the first 30 minutes of the film a suicide bomb tore open the city where the factory was located the women were physically unharmed, but for those 20 days, they, were, they left their jobs behind to help the rescue operations on the street. They were to deliver buckets of water to victims in the areas of the blast, as well as for the rescue workers. Men pushed them aside, shouting at them to let men do it. But the two women, both nameless, continued to carry their buckets, even while soldiers threatened them with their rifles to stop. And then the young woman delivered a plastic jug of water to a rescue to the rescue crew. The camera dove into the side of the wreckage, which was nothing short of a horror. Marlene reached the bottom of her bag for a fourth bottle of Chardonnay. Days passed in the movie and only and on Day 14, the two women began to rebuild their lives after the tragedy as they traded stories about the ghost they both had spotted in the burning rubble on the day of the explosion. The, the women sat inside a stall that, severed fre that served freshly baked flatbread and tea, and then they stared off into the torn Bag Baghdad skyline as they talked. 
The older woman had seen him when she delivered water one late night. The medical workers were on break, and she walked a little deeper into the rubble this time, noticing that a man was crouched on top of the debris. He sat on his haunches, and he stared past the older woman. His eyes were red as fire, glowing like embers, and he sang a song under his breath, like a nursery rhyme. The woman grabbed the jugs of water she carried and left the site. And then the younger woman said she saw the, the ghost too, and he too had eyes of color of fire. The woman had started to dream about him. The man reappeared to each woman, each of the women in their dreams, in crowded buses, and in the faces of other people in Baghdad who survived the suicide bombing. Marlene fell into fell deep into the film, her happy place. This was the silence she had needed most. Inside the womb of the, mu of the movie theater, she lived through the two women inside Oe, and she was no longer part of Morton & Morton. She was not a co-op owner with a mortgage that was, bi was a bit more than she could handle. She was not a person that had some serious scares with mammograms every couple years. He was not Marlene. Halfway through the runtime, hard noises in front of her snapped her out of way. The man a few rows ahead was mumbling to himself and making cracking sounds as if he were chewing sunflower seeds by the mouthful. He nodded as if he were having a conversation with someone, but clearly the seat next to him was empty. 11, 11 a.m. Marlene cracked open the sixth bottle and drank into a syrup, into the syrupy good. She fished in her bag with her smartphone. Maybe it was better to break up with Brian Berger via text. Cut the cord. Stop the bleeding. Mix the metaphor and be done with it. She didn't care anymore. She just wanted to be done. Her fingers tapped relentlessly on the glass. She hoped the man seated in front of her wouldn't notice the glow on the, the device in her hands. She had bitched out teenagers many times in, in other Manhattan movie theaters when they were texting inside the theater. And now, here she was, composing messages to the man she was having an affair with. Sorry, everyone. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Do, 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 do. Well, I need to adjust this. I'm like super big. I am like super big on the screen. <laughs> All right, let's see here. The me. I, if everyone just excuse me, I need to take uh, just a short little break. I need to go get some cough medicine because I'm starting to feel a little froggy. So I will be right back.
and I am I am back. <laughs> All right, I'm feeling a little better. I just need to take a, just some some cold medicine and my antibiotics. So before I forget, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I am coming down from a uh, an upper respiratory infection, so I'm taking my time doing this. So if you notice that I'm like breaking up the reading to interacting is because I'm trying not to push myself too hard. So I, I definitely need to take definitely taking my health into consideration first before, before continuing on, you know, with, with pushing myself too hard. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Uh, we're back. Let's see here. She had bitched out teenagers many times in o over Manhattan movie theaters when they were texting inside the theater and now here she was composing messages to the man she was having an affair with we have to finish this she texted she cupped her hands over the screen and dimmed the brightness brian was quick to reply why it's just it just isn't right your promotion complicates things why are you texting me about this now this is very strange boo not strange at all. I'm coming to your office right now. No, don't do that. We've been trying. We, we've already drawn too much attention to ourselves. Stay in your office. Can't end this, Marlene. You can't do this to me. Her throat tightened up and tears began to well in her eyes. She fought them. She was not going to cry over this. She was too old to let this affair trip her up. It has to be over. And you're texting me to tell me what the hell is wrong with you? This isn't a negotiation, Brian. His end of the chat went silent. Though the bubble icon simmered, showing her that he was typing something on his, on his other end. It stayed that way for a long time, almost three minutes by her count. Fucking bitch. I told you that you can't do this to me. She reread the message in the blue bubble. Did he already, did he really just call her a bitch? Her stomach tightened with fear. She had seen so many domestic violence cases started, start with language like this. You don't get to talk to me like that. Oh, I can't? I'll do the f what, what I fucking want. You can't take this away from me, Marlene. I am nothing without you. What else do you want? You made partner today. You don't understand. You're supposed to be with me. Brian texted Marlene the only photo they had ever taken together. It was a selfie in Bryant Park, taken in a hurry and blurred at the edges. She looked genuinely happy in the photo. She had only ever felt this kind of contentment twice in her life. Once with Thaddeus and the second with Brian. The photo self-destructed in the chat app in both of their phones after 30 seconds. A safety precaution that gave Marlene a lot of relief. Told you to delete that image from your camera roll, Brian. Do this to me. Stop. You can't do this to me. If he was repeating himself, she knew he was very upset. It's over. End of discussion. She was glad she hadn't ever let Brian keep a single toiletry at her apartment. Even just a toothbrush would make this bigger mess than it already was. The only physical evidence of their affair was the memory of his stubble on her skin. The way he pumped her thighs with his veiny forearms, the ghost of his arousal inside her body, and the way she had <clears throat> his body with her mouth, her fingers, how he, he had moaned when she, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh, he, when he felt very submissive, <clears throat> spicy, 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 spicy. But there was also a thing, but there was also that single photo, the selfie that never should have they that they never should have taken together. Oh tight bitch, he texted. Brian's anger was not new to her, but it still stung 
to hear him act so surprised. She pressed her hand to her forehead and hoped the Norco would soon dissolve in the headache behind her eyes. She jammed the phone back into the bottom of her bag. Moy continued before her, and the younger of the two women rolled out dough to make flatbread in the older woman's kitchen. The young woman wore a headscarf, and she stared into the smaller magnetized window on her, on her refrigerator. The mirror was dark, like obsidian, and she lifted the black linen of her scarf carefully, as if she wanted to show it to an unknown presence inside the mirror to reveal herself to whatever thing lived on the other side. Electronic music blended with notes from an orchestra, swelling, swooning, lurking. A slice of the woman's chin was visible now, and the music grew, sil grew quiet. She was so close to showing herself to the other side of the mirror. But a knock at the door, door interrupted her. She let out a scream and flipped over the hot griddle with the flatbread on the stove. She burned her arm doing so. Someone growled in the theater, then hollow laughter boomed from the rows in front. Marlene didn't think the scene in the film was funny at all, but the person cackled and howled some more. The man in front stretched his arms out toward his sides. He stopped his laughter and shook his head from side to side. He chanted along strings of syllables up into the darkness, and their wet clicking sounds reminded Marlene of drum beats. He turned his palms toward the ceiling, and how odd, Marlene thought it was as if he was praying, asking for the grace of God. He held his arms back at his sides again, and they seemed much too long, like a puppet arms. Uh, um, wait a second. Why am I getting Okuyin vibes? Why am I getting Okuyin vibes? This is giving me Okuyin vibes. This guy is giving me weird Okuyin vibes. Why is the Okuyin? Why is the Okuyin here? Oh, I feel uncomfortable. Who else is feeling the Okuyin vibes? Because I sure am. Oh, jeez. Then the man tucked back, them back into his lap. The chant sped up, and then it became clear this was not chanting, it was prayer. His shoulders and arms shook, and she wondered. <laughs> Just keep reading. His shoulders and arms shook, and she wondered if he was jerking off in his seat, hearkening back to the days of Times Square that no longer existed. 11, 11 a.m. The film flashed sh in shades of indigo and cornflower blue. And Marlene felt it then. An anger, a loneliness packed into one neat little nugget that festered in her chest. She was not paying attention anymore to the plot of the movie. Instead, her anger was calling out to her to do something about this Jesus-loving perv in the screening room. Hey, you knock it. Hey, you shit. Knock it off. She shouted into the darkness. The man shouted. It was a tenor voice deep, but also a little ragged at the edges. He repeated. I'm calling the police. She stood up from her seat, swiping in the bag, in swiping in the bag in search of her smartphone. A public indecency charge was insignificant, but she wanted to feel right, to get the last word in. She wanted to scare this asshole. He stood up, and the light projected from the back of the room turned him into a figure of dark blue, gray, and green, contoured by shadow. Marlene couldn't see his face, but she could see his whirly outline. Wiry outline. The man shouted again. 
extending the puppet arms again at his side. They still seemed way too long, frail, almost like those of a rag doll. Marlene was not afraid. She was angry. Her mouth and arms tingled. She wanted to show this asshole that what it looks like to behave in a movie theater. The man hooked his arms over the back of the seat and with a single stride thrust one leg over the rows of chairs. His other leg followed. The extremities clearly cleared the cinema chairs with the agility of a praying mantis clamoring over a bunch, a branch. As he hopped over the row, Marlene could see his face was pockmarked, like the aftermath of many bouts of teen teenage acne. He was just one row away from her. She stood up. What the hell are you doing? He climbed over one more row and loomed over her. She clenched her fist, ready to clock him if, he, if needed. I'm not playing games with you. He was much shorter up close, she had imagined. Shorter than her, maybe 5'6", but she could still not make out his face. Despite the fact that the light from the movie projection should have lit up, lit his features up, Oi went dark as the two women ascended into the abandoned, bombed-out apartment building, and the lack of lighting in the film put the man into deeper shadow. Shipe Toltec. Just a moment before, he had been clothed in some sort of short-sleeved shirt, but now, close as she could see, his bare skin was exposed, or what was left of it. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, isn't Shipe Toltec what... Isn't Shipe Toltec what Sholoro said to Clara Montes in 13 Secret C Cities? Towards like the very end? Wait, wait a second. My brain is breaking. I know, I just keep reading. I know, my brain just broken. Just a moment before he had been clothed in some sort of... <laughs> my brain is just breaking. It's like all these images from 13 Secret Cities are just popping up. Um, Let's see here. Uh, da -da 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 -da, his skin was exposed, or what was left of it. In the, in the murk, she saw horrible things, flaps of skin and wounds and cuts that should not be possible except in a butcher shop. The man's op opened his mouth, but he did not smile. The mouth was toothless like that of a very old person. His gums were wet, black, runny. The man held, had held a long, sharp object in his hand, and it glinted silver in the theater. She had, she had seen something like it before, but she couldn't recall when or where. The man fondled the weapon with tenderness. The film continued, and the dialogues of the Iraqi women spattered through the speakers. The man stared right into Marlene's eyes, and now that he was up close, his chest and belly no longer looked like no longer looked like hamburger meat, and he was no longer naked. He was clothed in the t-shirt and jeans, but the sharp object was still there at his side. His shoulder muscles bunched up as he gathered energy and stood before her just two feet away. She Toltec. Oh, God. She turned on the balls of her feet to pivot from the man and run down the aisle, but she was too late. He swiped at her with the sharp object once, twice, and she felt stings across her throat and her belly. The movie projector flashed like strobe and the blade in front of her sliced, wet, spread across her torso and she put her hands up remembering the boxing stance she had learned from her personal trainer but soon the man lunged right at her and she could see right in his face one of his wiry arms pinned her shoulder while the other had swiped and sliced did she smell something like freshly cut flowers 
She shouted as the sharp objects cut through the air sideways and down. Her neck snapped back. She lost consciousness, and the darkness of the movie theater shrouded her vision. Oh, jeez. Did I just get emotionally attached to a murder victim? Did I just get emotionally attached to a murder victim? Uh... No, now I remember Shippe Totec was basically what the Okuyin kept saying to, uh, to Clara Montes when he was trying to kill her. When they were fighting. Oh, jeez. Jeez. So yeah, we've so hey everyone, we've got a serial killer. <laughs> ah. Two twenty-eight p.m. Detective Nestor Buñuel pushed with two hands the doors of the Megaplex screening room to join the rest of the police on site. Some heads turned and others used to his presence went back to the work at hand. All the lights in the cinema were turned on and the screen, a gigantic screen at that, stared at the police like the milky eye of a dissected animal. Nestor had never been in this theater and he noticed that the decor was a blend, a blend of contemporary and art deco design. The seats were upholstered with blue fabric and the aisles carpeted with in a dull gray with tiny flecks of yellow in sprinkles on oh like sprinkles on an ice cream cone. Detective Buñuel walked on the balls of his feet, barely making a noise as he moved deeper into the cinema. The victim had chosen the best seats in the whole house to watch the movie, right in the middle aisles and centered right before the gigantic screen. He caught a glimpse of her now, reclined, no, cascaded was more like it, over the back of one of the seats, hair trailing down, hands open, pointed upward to the black ceiling, a ragged hole in her chest. Her face, even in death, radiated beauty. The cheekbones were strong, the chin sharp, the skin dark and supple. Marlene Grew, 52 years of age, bore a striking resemblance to the former First Lady Michelle Obama. Yet Grew was perhaps even more beautiful. Michelle Obama invoked memories of a different time in the United States. A time of sweet imperfection and good intentions, before everything went into the shithole. Before they literally rounded up black people in the streets like cattle. And the country crawled toward a new civil war. Nestor kept his observation tucked away in his mind. And focused on the scene at hand. Gentlemen, step over this way. Captain Aiden Smith said. He found a position in the aisle about 15 feet away from the body and closer to the silver screen so he could talk to his officers. The group of police investigators was made up of four men as well as one woman. Delia Douglas, but the captain, well, one woman, Delia Douglas, but the captain made no excuses for his faux pas in addressing the group. One of the detectives helped Smith slip his hands into nitro gloves as if assisting a surgeon in the operating room. At 11.32 a.m. today, we received a 911 call from one of the managers at this theater. He reported finding a body in one of the aisles. Officers arrived at 11.41 and discovered the body of a black female, age 52. There were six employees on duty and in today's morning shift. There are all, they are all accounted for and waiting downstairs for any further questions. And, and patrons, someone asked. Officers counted five in total, including the victim. 
distrup- distributed throughout the 18 screening rooms. All were in the theater for the first showings of the day, which generally start at 9 a.m. Officers have interviewed them already and released them. Smith glanced at the corpse of the victim, curled his lips, removed his glasses, swept lint off his three-piece suit, and nodded to Delia Douglas. Possible cause of death of massive, massive hemorrhaging, massive hemorrhage, Delia said, due to the damage to the thoracic cavity. The victim's torso had been punctured and lacerated. Stabbed, Nestor thought. And can't candy coat the words. Can't candy coat the words. She was stabbed, cut, and sliced. Approximately 26 times, the heart had been removed from the rib cage. The shredded clothing indicates a struggle, and we were still working to determine the particulars and where and when death actually occurred, especially if the victim bled for an extended period of time. Any signs of sexual assault? Nestor said. None. Her undergarments are untouched. No sign of tampering, th- though we will look for fibers and DNA, certainly. The team had found blood splatters as far as eight rows down. Oh, sorry. The team has found blood splatters as far as eight rows down, Captain said. So I advise you do not walk through the aisles unless you are with the crime scene unit or you have been cleared for access. We have no suspect at this time. And what do we know about the victim, Nestor said. Grew Marlene, partner in a law firm just down the street said, made a name for herself in corporate law. Quite a looker. A couple of investigators giggled. Delia Douglas turned her facial expression into stone. Angry or disenfranchised, Nestor couldn't tell, though he could make a very good guess. When, when you've been murdered, Nestor thought, it would be fucking nice to get some respect and not have your investigators focus on your face and tits. But there was a little but there was little that he could do about Smith's comment over the year. Nestor had to figure out when it was wise to go to battle, and this was not one of those times. Any domestic abuse leads, Nestor said. Maybe she was followed here? None. She divorced, and her ex husband's alibi is already set. He works for NBC News and is accounted for. Any boyfriends, lovers? We're just beginning the investigation, but she was single and not dating anyone, as far as anyone knows. Nestor made a note in his notepad to go deeper into the lawyer's personal life once he finished up at the scene. Marlene Grew had been laid face up the back of the seat, and her eyes rolled back in her head, showing only the whites. Nestor ran some calculations of the length and width of the theater, and was ready to start surveying the scene himself. And the projectionist? Nestor said. Oh, that's nothing but a memory of the old days, Smith said. There are no projectionists in the movie theater anymore. Let me guess, Nestor said. Robots, pretty much. Nestor glanced up into the back of the room and noticed the lights were out in the projection room. He made another note to himself. We have a manager on, we have a manager on, we have a manager on duty. He's your guy, Smith continued. He's on site for further questioning. Nestor caught a whiff of wetness in the air. It reminded him of the mangroves in Florida from his summer vacations with his mom and dad in elementary school. Digging in the wet clay with his father, looking for God knows what. It was earthy, sweet. It was an earthy, sweet smell. There was no breeze in this theater and the wall and with the wall and with the fall weather nice and cool outside. That meant that neither the furnace nor the air conditioner was running inside the theater. The clay smell vanished. But Nestor jotted down one more note of his horrendous hand in his horrendous handwriting which resembled nothing but Velcro hooks. And the staff member who found the body, Nestor said. 
No, sure. He dialed 911 after he walked into the screening room at approximately 11.15 a.m. The 911 call came in at 11.32, Smith said. <clears throat> so 17 minutes passed before he dials for help. Do we know he didn't... Do we know what he did during that time? Nestor asked. The usher said he ran out of the screening room to alert his manager. No, sorry. The usher said he ran down the, sc the screening room to alert his manager, Del Delia said. He and the manager came back to the screening room at around 11.23 a.m. He, the usher said he was afraid to get near the body. Do we know why? You'll need to chat with him later today, but he said that every time he tried to get near the victim, loud noises frightened him away. Way, 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 way. Wait. Oh, jeez. Right. The detective, the detectives murmured amongst themselves. Plainclothes officer Devin Jordan spoke up with a question. Captain, can you unpack that? Was the employee high? We don't, we don't know yet. We don't know that yet. Well, we don't. We don't yet know that, but it doesn't seem likely. My guess is that the movie was still playing and the usher was in a panic, overwhelmed by the sound coming from the soundtrack. Detectives, the employees was walking through the very corridor outside that you just walked through. And he said he heard something unusual coming from the theater. He said he heard growls, voices, and... And? Nestor prompted Smith. The manager heard a distinct sound of thunder and rain coming from inside. Smith's mouth twisted and Nestor knew that his captain was saving one last bit of information to toss out at the team. This was done to, this was done to draw dramatic effect, but also to inspire his detectives to dig further. Nestor disapproved of such theatrics and he was not in the mood for the suspense. But there was something else, right? Another sound? Correct, detective. The manager reported three sounds coming from the screening room. Thunder, rain, and the sound of birds. <coughs> wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Hold up. What? Wait, wait, okay. Okay, I need to I need to stop for a second. My brain just broke. So the bird that she saw at the beginning of the book, the bird she saw the night before was a harbinger of death. It was a harbinger of death. Because it said her name. At least that's what I'm getting because Oh boy. I know dot 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 you don't want to give anything away. I know you don't want to give anything away, so I, said, I know, I know, I know, I know you don't want to give anything away. It's just I'm like my mind is freaking blown. It is <laughs> so freaking blown. Right now at the moment. All right, here we go. 2.54 p.m. I know. I know. I know. But it's like, I, and I know you're enjoying seeing the connections I'm making. <laughs> and all the conclusions I'm drawing. Um, let's see here. Okay, hold on. 2.54 p.m. Smith pulled Nestor aside so that they could huddle by the emergency exit. It's good to see you, Nestor. Same here. The... Th the thing is, with the sounds, it's very unusual. Not so much. It was probably the soundtrack for the movie. Smith, have you actually seen the movie? Nestor said. No, I haven't. Well, we can't assume then OAE opened just two weeks ago. Are you saying the killer brought 
in his own portable speaker to commit the crime? No, what I'm saying is you don't know what the soundtrack of the film is, and you can't say for certain whether it contains the sound of thunder, rain, and birds or not. You're just always so... Yeah, I know, I can't help it. I see you want to get started. Walkthrough is over, Smith said. Puñuelo, debrief me by the end of the day. Yes, sir. Smith tucked his chin into his phone and returned to shouting into the speaker. Nestor flipped up a fresh sheet on his notepad. He walked down to the foot of the projection screen so he could begin his work. The forensics team made up of two specialists in organic fibers and metals worked in con concentric circles around the body, inspecting every aisle and every inch of the floor until they would eventually reach the mutilated body of Marlene Grew. Nestor carried his own LED flashlight because in all his years working up cases, he had never had too much light on a crime scene. He focused on his breathing, letting his shoulders drop and softening his belly. Without mental focus, he would be able to do his job. He took in the scene with eye, nose, and even skin. Nestor withdrew his Sony RX503 point and shoot camera from his jean pocket and powered it on. The innocuous camera took better 10K video than the DSLRs the department provided and with low-light images were better than any he had ever seen. More importantly, since he had his own, he was the owner of the gear, Nestor had disabled Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on the camera permanently to add an extra layer of security for his data. Nestor took four steps back in order to frame the murder scene as widely as the aisle would let him. He, he needed the landscape view. He glanced up above and saw the gray eye of the projection screen tower, tower above him. The theater before him seated roughly 350 people. It was important not to begin to not begin. Uh, bleh, it was important to not begin to inspect the scene visually with a small with the smaller details first, because the first view, the macro view, needed to be understood first. For him, the screening room extended upward and out, like a coliseum of red upholstery and black plastic. Up in the middle of the seats, slightly toward the left, the forensics team hovered over the victim. The layout of the theater was typical of a big chain, a main aisle in the center and a row and narrow aisles flanking the sides. No stadium seating, at least not in this screening room. The theater itself was a vulgar, was as vulgar as could be. Part of a major corporate chain of theaters, and it looked like, and it looked and smelled exactly the same in the twenty continental states they operated in. A mix cinema. <clears throat> this was yet another contribution to the. Mon monoculture of the planet that was making so much of the culture so bland. Nestor pressed the shutter button multiple times and the flash crackled with harsh light. The forensics team took a few steps away from their work, giving Nestor a view of who had come there to see. Floating a vast ocean of cinema seats, the victim lay face up. Nestor took a couple of more breath, deep breaths and analyzed the body, the pose, the colors, and the silhouettes. This was Marlene Grew. She faced the ceiling, and her half-naked torso, bathed in blood, bent outward like a crescent shape. From this angle, Nestor couldn't see her eyes, but instead, just, as long, just a long, elegant neck and her lips. Between her breasts, 
the hole where her heart had been. Ragged bits of flesh glimmered wetly around the light from some from the scones, sconces, and the ceiling lights. Her breasts were full, bathed in blood, and nipples of the color of rust. The position of the body had the hands at the at the sides with the palms facing up and the smooth lines of the neck that curled back over the seat was exact was actually very serene as if something very important had just happened in this room Nestor snapped more shots took a few steps closer to the body and snapped a few dozens more the camera clicked and word like an extension of his hands eyes and brain nestor breathed in deep and instead of trying to brush aside the stench of copper from his nostrils he allowed himself to really smell it to open up his nose to all the notes in the room beneath its sharp tang there were was also the smell of almond joy nachos carpet cleaner and even stale urine woman's perfume and expensive soap and another smell like swamp or dirt after the rain somewhat pleasant but unusual and suddenly he also detected the mangrove smell he, he caught earlier when he entered the room he took five more steps so he could get it close so he could get as close to the body as he could without stepping into the aisle when he saw her close up his throat cinched up Nestor had seen many bodies at murder scenes before, but never one whose heart was missing. As he leaned closer to the wound, he did not look away. 3.10 p.m. Nestor ran the pen light along the edges of the wound. He spotted small cuts radiating out, even more precise than the main wound. These were shallower incisions, just like paper cuts. They covered the perimeter of the main wound, and Nestor could not make out their meaning. The cuts formed some sort of glyph, but none that Nestor could recognize. A vertical incision, not unlike a cut for heart surgery, split the center of the chest open. Nestor cut a sh caught a shape in his peripheral vision. Officer Devin Jordan. I don't mean to tell you how to do your job, detective, but you may want to look underneath the body if you want to get, if you can, get a shot of the lat muscles right in the back beneath the shoulder blades. I know what lats are, Devin. Of course. How would? How? No. Uh, of course you No, ah, of course you would. Your bodybuilding and all that, of course you would know. Not a bodybuilder, Devin. Nestor felt sorry for Devin. He had the potential to be a great investigator, but his passivity, his craving to please and not show any kind of dissent to anyone, was a huge setback for the man. Help me out, will you, Devin? Of course. Just grab my camera and shoot while I shine my flashlight on the wound. It's a good suggestion you made. There, beneath the straps of the bra beneath the shoulders, and just an inch or two below the armpit, Nestor spotted a couple more symbols carved just deep enough into the skin to draw blood. Follow me, Nestor said. Together they walked through the back of the theater, crossed the hallway to reach the bottom, the other door, and walked over to the, over to the body from the right aisle. By doing so, they could avoid walking in front of the screen, which was no longer accessible. As the crime scene investigation unit worked on the blood that had dripped beneath, dripped down beneath the seats toward the front of the room. Nestor scribbled more notes on his pad while Devin tapped notes into his phone. <clears throat> We're going to miss you, Detective, Devin said. I'll miss everyone, too. 
Well, almost everyone. I know what you mean, Devin said. But despite that, almost everyone in the department is pretty nice. It's a good place to work, I suppose. This is exactly Devin's problem. He sugarcoated, he hid what he really felt. In fact, Nestor had been there for many conversations where other officers and staff referred to Devin as a fag, even to his face. But Devin, he carried on, smiling, taking all the abuse without actually responding to what was being said to him. God, I know what that's like. Jeez, I know what that's like. Anyway, so, so you think you can close this case in just one month before you're out of here? Nestor ignored Devin's question. Nestor clicked his pen light off and tucked the notepad into his jacket. He pressed his lips together, turned to Devin. The officer was in his early 40s, and he supported two adopted children with his partner. He always worked extra hours. Devin had joined the force in his late 30s, which was much too late. But Nestor could judge a man on that account. A journey was a journey, and that, and it wasn't up to him to tell other people how or when to navigate their trips. I bet you'll be glad to do what you really want to do. Just write your books and forget the problems of this department. Nestor checked his phone for messages and snapped off his nitro gloves. He patted Devin on the shoulder. Writing doesn't... Wait. Writing doesn't help the problems I've got, he said, and walked out of the cinema into the hallway. 3.13 p.m. One of the uniformed police was waiting for Nestor in the hallway, in the hall. He talked to a thin man with a mustache and a shirt and tie. The officer gave Nestor a look up and down, squinted, and turned to the thin man. Nestor, Nestor, this is David Avila. He manages the theater. Avila's handshake was firm, but also nervous jittery. You can call me Nestor. Detective, I've already called corporate, David said. We'll be shutting down the theater for the rest of the day. That's wise. None of the teams will be done anytime soon. What else did corporate tell you? To not answer any media questions, to let corporate PR make any statements. Walk me, walk with me back towards the doors of the screening room. We won't be going back inside for now, but I want you to help me retrace some steps. Avila frowned for a moment, as if he had been asked to do something he didn't want to answer. But then he nodded. The officer peeled off and walked back into the screening room. My men tell me there are no projectionists here, Nestor said. He set the pace for their walk, slow, measured, even creating a sense of privacy between them to make Avila feel safer and more willing to trust Nestor. That's correct. We manage all the projections using a computer. The server programs, the show times of the main feature, plus the trailers. Maybe times have moved faster than I ever imagined. I should have guessed everything's automated now. We employ a few people. We employ very few people anymore. Even the cleaning crews are being replaced with automated cleaning robots. Does that mean the projection room was empty during the showing where the murder took place? Technically, yes. Managers and, and or select employees can enter the projection rooms, but they generally run by themselves. We only go in there in case we have a reboot hardware. We have to reboot hardware. And there are no cameras inside the actual screening rooms. None. You could say that there's only one eye in the cinema, and that's the eye of the projector, which is just a robot. But you have cameras everywhere else. Correct. We monitor every hallway, bathroom, and concession stand. The concession stands, the space inside the theater. We don't actually have cameras in the screening rooms. Yet. Detective, how do you know that? 
Well, surveillance is everywhere. Corporate announced that infrared cameras are coming, but that's a year away. He reached the doors of the screening room. Nestor eclipsed the theater manager with his girth, and he stepped away from the overhead lights to diminish himself and seem less harsh under the lights to build even more trust. Who on your staff discovered the body? John Dean. He was on duty on the, this floor at the time. He heard noises. Tell me about that. Davy Avila hesitated. The bags under his eyes were gray and his body language spoke of a discomfort and perhaps a certain kind of loss, but the man was energetic nonetheless. This is the 13th and final movie by Samuel Cahan. And any chances I get to see the film, to hear the film, I'll take them. There's no director like him and they'll never be. Can you be more specific about what you mean? As you may have known, parts of Cahan's genius comes from his use of music. He always picks the right music for each and every one of his films. He used Beethoven in Kino Lodvico, John Strauss's Blue Danube Waltz, and John Coltrane in Xenogenesis. Xenogenesis. Simply masterful. So tell me about the music in Oi. I've seen the film three times since it's premiered two week since it premiered two weeks ago. And I'm a I'm just blown away. Blown away, detective. How did Cahan do it? How could he infuse such magic into a single movie? You tell me. Cahan based Oi on the novel by David Sa David Saba. Do you know the book? I don't. <clears throat> Nestor shook his head when he was when he had started publishing his novels in the, his early 30s. He had stopped reading fiction altogether. Nowadays, he read only science journals, military histories, and bi biographies of Colombian novelists. It's about two women who join a rescue mission after a suicide bomb tears apart a whole city block in Baghdad. Why do these two women survive, and why do they keep seeing ghosts? In the rubble. Seems very different from Kane's movies about outer space and aliens or correctional technical techniques for criminals. Ah, but that's ah, but that's the magic of Kahan. Each one of his movies is as different as can be from the others, Detective. Just look at the man the Marston house. It's Kahan's foray into the horror genre and it was unlike any others he had directed up until that point. And he never made a movie like Marston, Marston House again. He was a true original. So about the music in Oi. Mind-blowing. Cahan used the music of the Swedish synth rock group Archangel. Hey? What? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep reading. And juxtaposed it with Bella Bartok's Bluebeard's Castle. Just thinking about it sends chills up my spine. We have lost one of the true great films. Is all I can say. Well, true greats of film is all I can say. I didn't know he died. A year ago, in his house in upstate New York, the end of an era. What? Archangel is in this too? Jeez. Okay. Avila put his hands together close to his lips as in prayer. His eyes watered as he looked very afraid. If you wander down the hall where the movie is playing, you can hear its music. It's very hypnotic. And this morning I could hear it from where I was one floor below. You must be bullshitting me. The sound carries that far. In some spots, the flooring is very thin. Today, I heard something different. But even as I noticed it, I decided not to make a big deal about it. Different how? 
I heard thunder, loud cracks like the end of the world. I thought it was raining outside, but raining wrongly. Wrongly how? Ever been to the jungle or to the woods? Yes. Like that. The kind of rain where the trees and earth are part of the sound. Like a titan is shaking the world. And what happened next, David? John Dean came running toward me, babbling, telling me he saw a medical emergency on your We had a medical emergency on our hands. Avila cleared his throat. He was very spooked, and he didn't want to go back into the theater by himself. So we went together. So you went together. Well, only up to the main doors. I walked in, and at first I thought the room was empty. But as I went down the aisle, I saw her, just like you found her. It's possible for someone to enter the theater from the emergency exits near the screen? Yes, of course, but we are notified in an app if those doors are opened. They set off an internal alarm. No such thing happened today. Whoever did this would have had to be in the room with her. Avila bit his lip and turned his head, and his eyes welled with tears. Do you need a minute? In all his time as a detective, Nestor had always been able to spot this type of moment. It was as if the source of something lodged in his throat, or of in his or her throat, and needed to be spit out. You need to know something. What's that? I knew immediately from the way the killer left the body, I was looking at something special. Come with me, please. Nestor followed Avila out in the lobby, looked away from the teams of investigator. Once they were out of earshot, Avila leaned in with spearmint gum breath. Detective. That body. The way the killer sliced open her chest. The way it just lay there. I saw that before. Did you ever see Cahan's movie, Nine Lords of Night? Never. There we go, everyone. There's the title of the book. <laughs> Never. I have never seen. I have. I have. I've seen it at least thirty times. I own a copy of it on Laserdisc. If you remember what those were, if you remember what those were, she was cut up and positioned just like one of the murders committed in that movie. What is Nine Lords of Night about, David? It's a mystery unlike any you could ever imagine. 3.31 p.m. Avila. Oh, no. Don't, Roku, please don't make me read this in telenovela mode. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go again with telenovela mode. We're going to get extra dramatic. And oh, I was about to drink water, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Here we go. We're going into 3.31 p.m. I'm going to mark this. Hold on. 3.31 p.m. We're, we're heading into telenovela mode. Then we set the timer. For 10 minutes. Let me take a sip. Avila pushed the table right beneath Nestor's face. Google images showed him a distorted images. Funny, fuzzy and grainy. A mirage in VHS. That's a steal from nine lords of night. But what is it I am looking at? Help me out. A human figure had been draped over a wooden bench, arms splayed at the sides. The gender was impossible to determine, because the figure was dressed in long robes. Sunlight from a courtyard, or maybe a skylight, washed out their features. The robes had been ripped open at the chest, and a hole had been carved out. Super impossible. Superimposed on the image was a shape, something vaguely humanoid inside a widely wide black sky. Objects hung from the figure's neck, wrist, waist, and ankles. Nestor didn't know that 
much about film, but it looked ghostly, overexposed. Do you see a tentacled monster up in the ceiling? Nestor squinted and shook his head. Funny, that's the one most people see. I see it. A squid-like thing bristling with eyes. Horrible looking. Just ceiling. And in a lower right corner of the frame, detective, what do you see? The shape of a man or a woman. Not sure. Grayish white. You don't see dots or loops or an eye of an eagle? David Avril bit his lips. No! Not at all! God, sorry. I'm so sorry, so sorry. That's the strangeness of the film, detective. Some people see figures. Some see the squid monster. And a few like you see a white figure. Nestor had dealt with copycat murders in the past, but this was a fucking stretch. He took a second look at Avila to search for clues. A harmless eccentric, most likely, but a determined one. What other things do people see in the film's images? Some see a beautiful pair of twins. Other people see re have reported seeing the face of Jesus Christ. Nestor noticed how quiet and still these carpeted hallways were, even now, with a dozen officers milling about. The elevator doors loomed at every at the very end of the hallway with a massive red door beneath fan-shaped Art Deco dials. Every inch of the space silent as a cave. Nestor snapped out of his distraction and turned back to David Avila. What's the movie about? We would need a couple of hours to really unpack that. You see, Samuel Kahan's films worked on so many levels. I've heard that. What kind of levels? Many people think that Martin House was commentary on the cover-up by the U.S. government about the AIDS crisis. You're kidding me, right? The vampire movie? There's symbolism in every frame. Clues that Kahan inserted. And let me guess, Xenogenesis was subliminal messages too. Of course! They say that the moon landing in 1968 was a hoax, and that Cahan's mastery of cameras and special effects in Xenogenesis was shared with NASA. Get the hell out of here! And Cahan left clues inside the movie Xenogenesis? People really spend this much time picking apart these films? Come on, detective, it's Kahan! He was nominated for an Academy Award 13 times! Okay, relax, Avila. How many did he win? Just one for visual special effects for Xenogenesis. Nestor had to admit this man's passion was infectious, but he had a big day ahead, no time to waste. Uh. <laughs> to waste. So it was. So was it the movie Nine? So what is the movie Nine Lords of Night about? About a man. And a woman who conspire together to commit the perfect crime in order to avenge their people. You see, they have been sold out and they want justice. Nestor took a deep breath. Don't get angry, detective. I'm not. I just thought you looked like the kind of person who might apprentice, appreciate this esoteric bit of film history. What makes you think I look that way? Avila blushed and broke eye contact. I don't know. Sorry, I brought it up. No, humor me. What is it about me? You're not like other people, Avila said. I can sense it. 
you are different. The air conditioning system kicked in and filled the air with the robotic hum. Nestor's stomach cramped for a moment. 3.45 p.m. Nestor took a seat in the math teacher's office and squeezed the water from the tea bag into the trash can. The decor was genetic, and it housed a couple of computer stations, several phones, and filing cabinets. The walls were lined with inspirational quotes. Wait, did, did, did this, this break? Hold on. I need to know how much actual time is left. Uh, stream deck. Why? Why'd you break, stream deck? I don't know how much time is left. Oh, it's done. Okay. Well, we're supposed to be done. But it broke. So we're just going to keep going until, until I go back to color. Go back into color. Uh, let's see here. Goodness. All right, there we go. The filing cabinets were lined with inspirational quotes in photo frames. You can't, you can't start the next chapter in your life if you keep reading the last one. Doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. Nothing is permanent in this wicked world, even your troubles. Leadership is about making others better as a result. As your presence. Of your presence. And making sure that impact lasts in your absence. Jesus fucking Christ, Nestor said under his breath. This was the stuff Captain Smith lived for. Self-help garbage. Nothing but a jargony opioid to forget the brutal realities of what office environments were actually like. Nestor took the first sip off the Lipton black tea just as David Avila came into the room with John Dean. Dean was a short, stocky man of about 24 years of age with a baby face and a pencil-thin mustache from the Clark Gable era. I know, I'm going to be stuck in telenovela mode until I, until I revert back. <laughs> Let's see here. His face was drained of any joy, but he, but he stared at Nestor intensely as he pulled up a seat with his boss across the table. Dean extended his hands first. Detective, he said. I've got to put my hand up on my head. You guys can't see it. <laughs> Detective, he said. The handshake was hard and unrelenting. John Dean Avila said. Detective Nestor Buñuelo, good to meet you. Nestor said. John, can you describe what happened this morning? He smiled, cleared his throat. Oh, oh good, we're back. We're back. I can stop reading that in telenovela mode. Thank goodness I can read it normal again. <sighs> All right, let me... <laughs> uh, all right here we go <laughs> all right where was i dean smiled clear the throat i do routine checks through throughout the theater and if i may say so i'm damn good at it aren't i david david nodded just as he let out a short sigh i've taught you well i've checked theaters six through twelve this morning already and 13 was the last one on that. 13? Thirteen. 13. Aha. Uh -huh. 13. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. I'm seeing a pattern here. I'm seeing a pattern here. <laughs> Anyways, and 13 was the last one on that floor. Tell me, what were the checks? <laughs> Tell me what the checks were like in the other theaters, Nestor said. Routine. Just a handful of patrons in the building. Mostly parents bringing children to see Pixar movies. What are the... What are these steps you... When you... What are the steps you perform 
the check in the theater. Well, when you perform the check in the theater, I check the main doors, make sure they open and close properly. I check the corridor to make sure there's no trash or obstructions. Make sure the fire exit signs are working. And as I do all of this, I check for any potential terrorist threats. You specifically look for terrorist threats. Yes, of course. It's how they train us. They? Corporate. And what makes for a possible terrorist threat? Nestor said. Unusual bags, parcels left in the aisles, and of course, people that look like they don't belong there. What does a pers such a person look like? You're, you're kidding me, right, Mr. Buñuelo? Buñuelo? No, I'm not. Tell me. Well, nowadays, it's a little more complicated, but you know, I look for a certain kind of ethnic people. Go on. Don't know. Dean continued. It's something you just have a feel for, a knack, because it's not just Arabs and Muslims anymore, I see. You see, you've seen what's happening in, what's happening in Chicago and the South, right? Vigilantes is what they call them, but I call it as I see it, terrorism. I mean, some of these maniacs want us all dead. So tell me why they're a racist matter, John. The young man pursed his lips and blushed. He fidgeted at his seat and glanced sideways at his boss. You know, I'm thinking of going into the police academy myself. I think I could do be this better than other people. Dean drew air into his belly and cupped his hands together, doing his best effort to impress the two men in this room. Why is that, John? Nestor said. Dean had ignored his question about race, but he let it drop. Better to just let him talk. Because I know what's wrong and what's right. That's really what it's needed in a cop nowadays is it su in such a complicated world and someday you want to be a uniformed officer or detective neither I just want to go all the way to the top FBI, CIA Nestor clenched his teeth smiling at the young man this kid had been too scared to go back into the screening room by himself if you are afraid of dead bodies you will never cut it in this job John Dean. But instead of negating Dean's words, Nestor would feed his ego so he would reveal himself further. So if, if you're headed to the FBI, you're in the wrong line of work. Running a movie theater then. I realize, detective, all things in due time. And today, did you spot any... And today, did you sp spot anyone giving off any signs of being a terrorist? Can't say I did. Most people in here were white, except for, you know, her. Her who? The dead lady. So you walked me through what happened when you checked Theater 13. 3.59 p.m. Fifty-nine p.m. All right, everyone, I've been reading for quite a bit. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a, a quick 10 minute break so I can get some more water and to rest my voice for a little bit. And I will be right back. That's if, yes, it's going to let me. <laughs> That's if the stream deck will let me. Uh, let's go ahead and put 10 minutes on the clock. And I will see you all in 10 minutes. Be right back with some more Nine Lords of Night.
Hey everyone, so we are back. Oh my goodness. Let me put myself back correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right now at 3.59 p.m. This part of the story. Uh, I can, because I am still sick. So I'm, so in, again, like I said, I'm going to be thinking about my health first. Um, we're going to go ahead and end stream right here as far as reading the book. But we're going to talk about what we've encountered so far um we're gonna take this this little bit of time for the rest of the stream and just kind of talk what we've encountered and what we've learned and uh so the title of the book is the name of the movie that this quote-unquote copycat killer is uh is uh performing and so now see now the Bird on the book makes more sense because I was wondering where this bird was going to come come in to play. I was wondering. Oh, I'm going to bring in I'm going to bring in Blizz uh, to join me. So, um, Blizz, what did you think? So far, so good. Oh, no, it's great. I am pulled in. I was not expecting to get so pulled into uh her store into who she is because I thought um I didn't realize that we were gonna get so involved in the victim. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Before it became a detective story. So now it, yeah. now the chapters make sense. These are the detective's notes. Mm -hmm. They're written this way. The chapters are this way because these are the detective notes. These are these are Buñuelo's notes. And um it is, it is, as me, it is, it is so good. Um, and so like, I'm, I'm excited to read more of this book. Um, like, like I've done in the past, um, when we have free moments, we'll be continuing on with this book. Um, you should, you should, you should, you should go Amazon and get it. Because I'm reading it off Kindle. I'm reading it off my Kindle for PC. Um, but I do have the physical copy with uh, Cesar's signature in it, which that is also available for sale at, you know, ledqueens.com. <laughs> um, I, trust me, the first and second, like, I know you all were seeing me, like, react at certain things that reminded me of the first book it's because i that's how much i loved 13 secret cities and how deep dive i went in to 13 secret cities that um that going into nine lords of night i was like wondering okay so what is this gonna be what is this gonna be what's it gonna be and okay this is it's creepy Oh my gosh, it is definitely supernatural. This 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 is so far creepy. Um and I'm just wondering um are we going to what what's going to happen like are we going to is Buñuelo going to invest is going to is Buñuelo going to talk to Brian? Like what's going on? And the thing is that she was like, "Oh yeah, that sound or like you know that whole sound was like a harbinger of death or something like that, like that she was waiting to hear about somebody dying and the fact that the bird the bird said her name i was like it was telling her that she was gonna die and to do the right yeah. thing before she died wow that it wasn't too late for her to change things. And, uh, but that's, that's what it, that's what it, that's what it, that's how I read it. That's how I read that. Um, the fact that there were nods in her life, um, to Shalotl and to, to, uh, Blue Hummingbird. And, um, but yes, Blue Hummingbird is definitely my favorite character from 13 Secret Cities. Um, I'm, I, I'm interested where, where, um, where Detective Buñuelo is going to take this, like where his journey is going to go. 
Um, I'm drawn in. I am thoroughly drawn in, and I now need to know what is this movie about. Oh, welcome back! <laughs> welcome back. So, um, we were just saying we we're just, at this point. I decided to because of the way my um my voice is going, kind of like tired. I decided, you know, I still got a cold. Oh, Buñuel, Buñuel. I I keep adding the la the O at the end. I am so sorry. Yes, Buñuel. His last name is Buñuel. That, that's correct. Buñuel. I don't know why I keep Buñuelo. <laughs> yes, Detective <laughs> Buñuel. Um, so I'm excited Dude. to see what else Dr. Bu uh, Dr. <laughs> Detective Buñuel does. Um, but yeah, no, the symbolism behind sh the Shalotl and Blue Hummingbird and the snake and... It's like the famous Luis Buñuel. I, I, I kind of got that, that that was that there was like a uh, an homage in that name because it it the the names seem very pers purposeful in this in this novel, um, and uh, I'm just gonna say, yeah, I've noticed. I was like, I was like, yeah, everything is connected, and and you weren't kidding, um. I will say this. I the fact that it was it was theater 13 uh, come on. <laughs> come on. Theater 13 I mean what <laughs> bigger nod to 13 secret cities was that? I mean... <laughs> oh man. Yeah, the 26 wounds on Marlene. Like, that's vicious. But then it was, like, also about that there were, like, Nestor is 52. Yeah. Nestor is 52. Yeah, it is a lot of 13s. A lot of 13s. Um, I, I believe there was a 13... <laughs> Um, I think I, I believe there were thirteen colors in the bird that that she saw. In the bird that she saw, that was like the quote unquote harbinger of death. The bird with the four eyes, I believe it had thirteen colors. If I'm not mistaken. For the Aztecs, Maya was yeah. I think the bird had also 13 colors or something like that. Like it was like very, it had a lot of semi-precious colors in, in, in its uh, plumage. Um, but yeah, no, I am just, I am, but there was yet so many surprises in this book. Yeah, I know, I know, and the, the fact that it's just gotten more racist, the, the the racist people are just even more racist, and I'm like, damn, <laughs> the world turned to shit in 2025. It's like, they're like, when the mentioning of Michelle Obama was like, you know, the nice years, like, when it was kind of, like, not so bad, and then now, like, everyone's, everything went to shit. Everything's like, everything's to shit, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. It was just this is I, I like. I am curious as to yeah, vigilantes in twenty twenty five. Sadly, yeah. Um. Yeah, exactly. But thank goodness it's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote this, I believe, in 2016. It was like only four years after. After um, 13 Secret Cities, I believe that's when you said no, 28. What's it? Wait, hold on. Let me go. Let me go back. <laughs> Productions. Yeah, 2018. This was 2018. This book was from 2018. Yeah. 
I mean, it's published in 2018, but you wrote it 2016, 2017. Yeah. But yeah, no, it is. I mean, this is amazing. I, man. So we're just on day one. We're still on day one. This is, yeah, this is a very cool story, everyone. Like, I'm just going to say, you all understand, now you all kind of understand my, why I love this book series so much and why I want to make sure to read it to all of you because it is so good, uh, so good. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, this is really good. Um, and I, I honestly, uh, enjoy reading these for you all. Uh, I cannot wait to, to when we can physically have a physical copy of Hall of Mirrors, because that will signal when I'll be able to read this book. <laughs> No signal when it when I when it'll be all right for me to read uh, Hall of Mirrors, um, because this is just getting juicier. Like it is like damn. We went we went from we went from uh, a family story and like a spiritual journey in the first book to now like murder mystery, and it's just interesting yeah it is interesting like where this is going and uh i like how they're connected yet not connected like there's simple things that happen in the background of 13 secret cities that have made their way into this world so far that i have seen and i i i love the um the the how it has in how, how it's like like oh remember this oh remember this like i'm like i'm like please don't tell like all of a sudden the, the killer was like like when the killer was climbing over i'm like oh please no not the oku ying please i thought she i thought glad i got rid of the oku ying <laughs> All right, is that for me or is it or is that for LED? The question. Yeah, that Okuyin energy, and I'm like, yeah, and I was like, I'm like, that's the Black Descatlipoca doing his shit again, isn't he? Black Descatlipoca. Yeah, I love the continuity. I love the continuity because it's kept me in the book. Mm hmm Yeah, no, no. Um, two wolves. Oh, to me. Okay, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, sure. Sure, as me. You can ask me. You can ask me. Uh just shoot me uh shoot me a message uh in DMs on Discord. Um But yeah, no, I was like this is just like so cool. I am I am just enthralled with the world that you've created. I am I cannot wait to continue reading when my voice is a lot more rested and I'm at like my health is at like at a hundred percent because this was fun. A DM to DM question? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm right now. For those of you that don't know, I, I've, I'm still nursing through, nursing myself through a, uh, uh, through an upper respiratory infection. I took a good chunk of time off. Like, you know, I canceled my, my streams and stuff like that just to make sure that, um, that I was healthy enough to be at least able to do this. Like, this was supposed to be our monday stream but then i found out about the cancellation of tuesday and i was like cool i can move it to tuesday <laughs> and so i did i was like hey i need myself an extra day I, I needed the extra day which was good i really did 
So I'm just drinking water as we're going here, just making sure that uh my my throat is lubricated. Um, but uh, like all in all, I really enjoy enjoyed. I really enjoy where this uh story is going. <laughs> I really enjoy where this story is going. It is exciting, and I okay. So what people don't know, I'm really into like um suspense thrillers and this is scratching that itch <laughs> that's what people don't know i'm really into suspense thrillers um i was just not really expecting the spiciness level of the victim's life oh, yeah <laughs> i was not expecting that spiciness i was like read 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 oh my gosh this is too spicy for twitch <laughs> <laughs> oh man i was like oh damn i was like okay blah 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 blah. okay that's spicy uh this is safe to read they did adult things <laughs> to like skim through but if you all want to read the spiciness just go ahead and get yourselves a copy of nine lords of night by a novel by cesar torres very easily accessible, everybody. I'm just saying. Uh, and yeah. Oh my goodness. I've just I enjoy reading books for you all. I know it doesn't really get um the views and stuff like that, but that doesn't matter because that's what we're here for. We're here to enjoy this story, um, uh, because this is kind of like our little book club. And uh and that's what it's for here. It's for us to enjoy this little book club moment and and just uh that's what story time with DB is. It's 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 book club. It's our little book club. And um I will read what I can when I can. Um but my, the main focus to always um spotlight uh black, indigenous and people of color authors and also LGBT authors as well. Um because, you know, we need to be seen. We need to be heard. We need to be read. So there, that's why. That's why I do it. I do it because, not for the views, but or because it because because I enjoy reading the books. Like I read this book by um my goodness. By Rena Barron called Kingdom of Souls. And oh my goodness. I still haven't read the second book. In the uh the second book of Kingdom of Souls, but I am telling you, people, it's so good. That's a book I also recommend. But yeah, we are re for right now. We're doing um Lords of Night, and we're gonna continue doing R Lords of Night. Yeah, it's fun, dumb and tall. Yeah, um, but no, it, like I said, I really enjoy reading these books, and the fact that I get to read uh a friend's book makes it even more thrilling for me. Um, I've been dying to read these books. And so to get to read it with you all, it's even better, especially with the craziness that this stream brings with the two telenovela modes. <laughs> Thanks, Roku. <laughs> and of course, you know, my, uh, my stream elements, my stream deck was like, I don't know about that, man. I don't know about it. Do you really want to time it? <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, so I mean, like I said, I really enjoy these books. I, I hope you all enjoy hearing me read them. Uh, it's been fun. It, 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 I will continue to do this as long as you all will enjoy this with me. Um, but uh let's see here oh goodness uh let's go back into close-up stream everybody and let's enjoy the little pride parade because happy pride everyone happy pride um just you all that don't know this book is incredible love it so much i need more i agree i agree snacks i i need more too i need more too i can never get enough uh it, it's it's just really good it's just really good snacks you you have a good ear you definitely have a good ear in that bulb 
that you are. <laughs> all right, everyone. So um, I want to thank you all for hanging out for this uh, for this very special uh, Nine Lords of Night stream. Um, we are also going to be uh, tomorrow uh, for, for oh yeah, but for the entirety of of Pride Month, I will be continuing. There will oh, you all see the Pride Parade in all the streams. So it's gonna be like this for all month long. Um, also, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, thank you so much, LED. And you have yourself a great evening. Thank you so much for sharing your book with the world. Uh, I cannot wait to be able to read uh, Hall of Mirrors after I'm done with Nine Lords of Night because, oh, this is so getting good. This is so getting good. I I'm, I can't wait to see how much of both books is in the third book. Um, but anyways, so, but yeah. Uh, but thank you all so much. Thank you, LED. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a, and we're going to be doing, uh, oh my goodness, Stardew Valley with Akaros and Thursday we're going to be doing some more um Final Fantasy 14 with the generics in the uh and with uh with Arden Whitefur and then Saturday we're going to be going back to our Nuzlocke uh what I might do is I might alternate Nuzlocke and um 13 secret city and not 13 secret cities we already finished 13 secret cities and nine lords of night so we might do that to take breaks in between the nuzlocks it all depends on how i feel tomorrow um oh actually how, depending how, how we do on saturday with the nuzlocke uh if we need to take a break from it weekly you know every other week we'll do that but um i will let you all know so just stay tuned to the twitter for the schedule updates uh and again thank you all so much for watching have an incredible evening you can't you don't have to go home but you can't stay here good night